revoke relocation. So our uh, commissioners are here. We have quorum now. So thank you for your time. For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes, unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. Pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County. This is statutory writ of cert. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of cert to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Items in the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that that item be removed from the consent agenda. Robin, do we have any changes to our February 19 agenda? They can receive an administrative approval. And 1716 Greenwood is deferred until next month. Okay. Those are the changes to the agenda. I just want to make a uh, motion to approve that. So moved. So moved. Second? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Okay. And the motion passes. Are there any council members here? None at the moment. Um, approval of minutes of January 15, 2020. Madam Chairman, I've moved for approval. Okay, there's a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed. The motion passes. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. On consent today, we have. 1522 Douglas Avenue, uh, new construction of an addition with a setback determination. Uh, 942 Maxwell Avenue, new construction of an addition. 202 Manchester Avenue, new construction, addition, and dadu. 1108 South Douglas Avenue, new construction of an addition. 1514 Ferguson Avenue, new construction of an addition. 4205 Elkins Avenue, new construction of an addition. Um, and also the administrative permits issued for the prior month. Staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda with the applicable conditions, finding the applications to meet the design guidelines of their respective overlays. To Any questions to the staff on consent? Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes, so. Public hearing? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, public hearing. Anyone here to speak on any of these projects? Okay. Thank you for the reminder. <clears throat> Close public hearing. I move for approval. There's, there's a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed. So the motion passes to consent agenda. Roy, da Roy Dale and Councilmember Syracuse are requesting that the Cole House at 2001 Lebanon Pike be designated as a historic landmark. It was constructed by Edmund Cole circa 1859, the first part of it, and the house is, is significant as an example of early Tennessee vernacular architecture and is the only one of three Cole Homes resident residences remaining. Cole served as president of the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad and had extensive interest in iron and coal mines in Alabama, as well as large land holdings in the Nashville area. The National Register nomination states that the house stands as the only remaining residence of this noteworthy couple who contributed both culturally and monetarily to the advancement of Nashville. 
and that is one of the few remaining structures built by the early leaders of our state. The property was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1974. The building retains historic integrity, and there are no planned alterations. Therefore, staff finds that the property meets Section 17.36.120B5. Staff suggests that the Metro Historic Zoning Commission recommend approval of the historic landmark to the Planning Commission and Metro Council and the adoption of the existing historic landmark design guidelines to apply to exterior alterations. Staff finds that the building is listed in the National Register for Historic Places and therefore meets the qualification requirements. Open public hearing. Anyone here to speak on? 2001 Lebanon Pike. Okay. Close public hearing. Madam Chairman, um, having grown up in Donaldson uh, before the interstate came in, I drove by this house from a very early age and have always admired it. And I'm so glad to see it being preserved and, and placed in this landmark status. So I move that we support the uh, staff recommendation uh, to recommend approval of this as a landmark structure. I second it. Um, I do have a question, though, but I do second it. Sure. Okay. Um, so, are there had there been no um, additions to it at all, or just? Yes, there have been additions over time. Uh, one of them was fairly early on, and then there's been a more recent one in the back. But they're all the kinds of changes that retain that historic integrity of the earliest part of the building. Is this the front, though, that we're looking at right now? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the front porch has been enclosed for a while, but I've screened in, but other than that, it's... And that, that's one of the reasons I wanted to include the uh, front entry there, because when you're just looking at it, it doesn't look like much, but when you walk up and you can see well through that screen, yeah. you, you see what a great house it is. Right. Well, I see this shot that to the bottom left, I think, is it. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, commissioners? Okay. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece um, of history. Um, there's a motion, in, and there was a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed, so the motion passes. Okay, next we have another historic landmark overlay. Um, Robin kept hers really short. I feel like I might have gotten a little overboard on this one, but I'll try and go quickly. I have a lot of slides. So <laughs> next we have a request for a neighborhood landmark and a historic landmark designation. The neighborhood landmark will allow multifamily use in the property, and the historic landmark will ensure the long-term protection of the property. The two-story brick building at 1600 10th Avenue North was constructed in 1892 by a group of young women known as the Flower Mission. This group had formed the previous year with the purpose of providing flowers, ices, and delicacies to the poor sick in Nashville. They quickly saw greater need and shifted their efforts to caring for children whose mothers worked during the day. They began raising funds to construct a new building and secured a $2,500 appropriation from the county. In 1892, they purchased two lots at the corner of Polk and Scott Streets, today 10th Avenue North and Garfield Street. The building was constructed at a cost of $4,400 and opened in April of 1893. The original front facade of the building included the projecting entry bay and the side wing to the right. The other, feature, other original features include the terracotta detailing under the eaves, a stone foundation, and decorative brickwork. Here's the side elevation along Garfield Street. The one-story portion dates to at least 1897, but may well be original. In 1894, the Flower Mission changed its name to the Day Home for Working Women's Children, but was also known as the Polk Street Day Home. A 1909 newspaper article reported that the home hosted an average of 45 children a day, feeding them lunch and dinner and offering a variety of classes. The second wing was added in the early 1900s, north of the entry bay. It creates a fairly symmetrical facade with three bays of tall windows on both floors to match the south wing. The primary difference is the hipped roof line is lower and shallower on the later wing. The addition of this wing created an L shape to the building and a one-story porch was constructed along the L in the rear. This picture dates to perhaps the 1950s. The day home operated here until around 1924 when the property was presented to the Junior League to benefit their home for crippled children. The Junior League owned the property for six years before selling it to the Kofers Free Will Baptist Church in 1930. The church owned the building until 1956 and constructed a one-story rear addition in the 1950s to create a squared footprint. 
From 1965 to 2018, the property was owned by the Christ Temple Apostolic Faith Church. In 2018, it was sold to a private owner. The property is noted as a contributing building in the Buena Vista Historic District, which was listed in the National Register in 1979. This picture was a part of that application. The building retains historic integrity and remains contributing today. The neighborhood landmark and historic landmark requests both require this commission to review any proposed work to the structure. So now we'll briefly review the proposed changes. First, this fire escape here on the north elevation will be removed. This might be an early feature, but it's not significant and its removal is appropriate. On the front facade, there are several non-historic punctures into the historic masonry. This has been used for air conditioning units. These will be refilled with brick. There will also be a few changes to current fenestration. On the front elevation, this enclosed window will be returned to an open window. On the north elevation, the third window from the front will be converted into a door. Along Garfield Street, there are three bricked-in windows. One of these will be turned into a door, and the other two will be reintroduced as windows. On the rear elevation, the bricked-in window on the first floor will be reestablished. On the second floor, two of the enclosed windows will become doorways to a second level deck. The third window will be reestablished. These proposed fenestration changes are primarily located on side and rear elevations and all either restore or maintain original openings, although some windows are becoming doors. Staff finds the proposed work meets section 4A and B of the historic landmark guidelines. The project does not propose any change to the massing of the building, and no addition is planned. A portion of the roof of that 1950s addition will be used for an upper level deck, accessed by reopening those enclosed openings. The project meets sections 2B1 and 2 of the design guidelines. The windows and doors are not original and will be replaced. Except for those openings already discussed, the new doors and windows will fit within the existing openings. The applicant proposes to use multi-light windows. Based on the oldest photographs we have, staff recommends that the new windows be one over one and that staff review and approve the final window selections. The current front door is also not original. This early photograph shows what appears to be a four panel, three quarter light double door. Staff recommends a new door of similar design be installed. Further, staff recommends that the original transom shape and dimensions should be retained. The side and rear doors are not original and their replacement is appropriate. Staff recommends final review of railing materials and designs. Staff further recommends final review of wood trim repair and the final composite panel for the front gable field. Masonry will be cleaned and tuck pointed and there are some areas where more extensive work may be required due to decay, as you can see here. Staff recommends final review of this work as well. The bell tower will be cleaned and painted. Staff recommends final review of the method of cleaning. And lastly, staff recommends final review of fencing design and materials. In conclusion, staff suggests that the commission recommend approval of the neighborhood and historic landmarks to the Planning Commission and the Metro Council and the adoption of the existing historic landmark design guidelines to apply to any exterior alterations. Staff finds that the building is a contributing building to the Buena Vista National Register District and therefore meets the requirements of section 1736.120 and that the rehabilitation plan meets the historic landmark design guidelines, thereby meeting section 1740.160 of the ordinance with the conditions that the replacement windows be one over one windows with clear glass the original transom dimensions be retained, and that the applicant obtain final approval of replacement masonry, windows, new and replacement doors, repair and replacement of wood features, masonry cleaning and repair, bell tower cleaning, and design and materials of fencing and railings. With these conditions, staff finds the work to meet the historic landmark design guidelines, which meet the Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Questions for me? Did you want to speak? Uh, sure. If you want. Yeah. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Scott Morton with Smith G Studio. We are the applicant on behalf of the property owner, husband and wife, um, the Kelly family. They are traveling abroad today and couldn't be here, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have regarding their pr proposed plans for the property. Um, as was mentioned, there's a two-step process for this. The goal is to 
the renovation, the historical renovation of the structure and restoring all the historic detailing to the exterior facade uh, for the entire church. And then the interior renovation uh, to convert to seven residential condos uh, within the structure. And so all the improvements exterior will follow all the historic requirements and will require further approvals through historic staff on materials uh, and design features. I did just want to quickly note that uh, we have been in conversation with the community and the area council member. Uh, we have uh, support from the Buena Vista Heights Neighborhood Association. We hosted a meeting with them um, in two weeks ago, and we've also had several conversations with Councilman Freddie O'Connell, who is in full support of this application as well. Um, again, I I don't have anything further to add to the great presentation you just heard, but happy to answer any questions you may have about the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. I should have told Jenny this earlier and I forgot. Um, but we would like to add one condition to our recommendation, and that is that the applicant apply through planning for the historic landmark. They've applied for the neighborhood landmark but still do need to apply for historic landmark as well. Okay, very good. Open public hearing. Closed public hearing. Commissioners? I have one question. I mean, and I'm, I appreciate this and definitely um, in support of it, but the three windows at the top that they're turning into doors, are you, um, there's, there's no issue with that, I guess, right? Here on the second level? Yeah. Right. So those are all enclosed now, as you can see. Um, they are on the rear, and um, yeah. because that deck is a second level deck but not a rooftop deck, we felt that it would be appropriate. Thank you. Oh, good question. Okay. There's a motion to... Uh, based on that, Madam Chairman, I move that with respect to 1600 10th Avenue North that we recommend uh, landmark designation uh, with staff recommendations and conditions. There's a motion. Is there? Does that um, include the added condition that was just mentioned? That's correct. Thank you. Yes. Okay. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, None opposed. The motion passes. Next up, we have a historic landmark for Marathon Village. Council Member O'Connell um, has filed for historic preservation zoning overlay for Marathon. The proposed district includes two complexes listed in the National Register of Historic Places, which are industrial buildings associated with the manufacturing industry. First, a little background. The commission voted unanimously to defer based um, on concerns regarding the boundaries and owner opposition when this first came before you. The commission expressed concern with the qualification of the district due to the amount of vacant lots and non-contributing properties. Uh, the proposed boundaries have changed and no longer include Joe Johnson at 16th Avenues. The current boundaries include approximately 77% contributing buildings and several vacant lots. In addition, property owners express concern with the guidelines regarding height for new construction, not matching underlying zoning potential. So the design guidelines have been changed to match underlying zoning, with the exception of some properties immediately adjacent to the historic buildings and owned by Barry Walker. Uh, you have received public comment via email, and I believe we also have a comment from uh, Council Member O'Connell, but it was sent just recently and I cannot access that right now. The area includes two buildings listed in the National Register of Historic Places, industrial buildings associated with the manufacturing industry, and additional industrial buildings located on Clinton Street. The two buildings listed in the National Register of Historic Places are the Mill Building, next slide please, um, which was the one you just saw, sorry about that, and then the administrative, administrative building, which is this one. In 1995, the National Park Service found uh, the district eligible for the National Register under Criterion A of the National Register's criteria for its significance to the industrialization of Nashville and Tennessee between 1881 and 1914. Marathon Village represents Nashville's and the state's industrial and economic history reflected in the changes use changing uses of the buildings from Nashville cotton mills to Marathon Motor Works. Although the building underwent modifications in the period between serving as a cotton mill and then an automobile manufacturing plant, few changes have occurred since 1912. Next slide. 
The overlay also includes the industrial strip at 1404 Clinton Street, as well as the, next please, uh, George M. Fly and Sons building located at 1419 Clinton Street. They are contributing buildings to the overlay because of their association with the industrialization of Nashville. The proposed district meets section 17.36.120A5 as a portion of the district is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The areas outside of the National Register district meet section 17.36.120A1 due to its association with the Worthen Industrial Complex and its contribution to the understanding of the history of the industrialization of Nashville. Staff suggests that the commission recommend approval of the Marathon, Marathon Village Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay, finding the area to meet criteria one and five of section 17.36120. Staff recommends the adoption of the draft design guidelines proposed for the new district, finding that they are consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards. Do you have any questions for me? Okay, thank you, Robin. I guess the notes will reflect that the Council um, of District 19 has given you his um, recommendation as well. He is, de he is the applicant, right. and I believe I have an email. I don't know for sure. Okay. All right. Uh, open public hearing. Close public. Oh, come on forward, please. Uh, James James Hensley. I'm uh, with Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery. We're located in 1414 Clinton Street. Um, we've been there for seven years, uh, open to the public since 2014. About 60 employees. Pardon me. Take a second here. Um, and we see about 80,000 guests a year. That increases annually. Um, Last year, we took on a majority investment for uh, with uh, Constellation Brands, Fortune 500 company, to um, maximize the potential of the space and the business. Um, we're looking at doing a close to $4 million renovation to be able to maximize the potential uh, of tourism and also production. Being included in this overlay will cause issues to prevent that from happening. Obviously, our company has a long history in Nashville as well, if, you're, if any of you are familiar with it. Um, we understand the historic context and how important it is to preserve the history of the city. Um, we just don't believe that the physical building that we are in necessarily needs to be included in this overlay. We agree that the buildings that are uh, already uh, on the registry uh, should certainly be in that. However, we feel that it puts undue burden upon our business to have this overlay implemented uh, and will cause uh, serious reper uh, repercussions to our business. So we'd like the council to consider please removing the parcels that we lease and have a long-term lease on from the overlay and like your opinion. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hensley, could I ask you a question? Yes, you, uh, you mentioned a couple of times the severe implications of this legislation. Can you elaborate upon that and tell us how this uh, jeopardizes the plans that you've come up with? I certainly can. Um, uh, one of the many things about being in a, in a building of its age uh, is that it doesn't necessarily have everything that you need to have to have a modern business. One of those things would be a loading dock, okay? So uh, installing a loading dock so that uh, trucks can uh, both deliver uh, raw materials and pick up finished products uh, would be hindered by the limitations put on by the historic overlay and the augmentation to the exterior of the building. Uh, further issues would come uh, from a tourism aspect and the design ideas that we've already spent a considerable amount of money on before this was ever presented to us, by the way, um, uh, in uh, being able to open up the front of the building with uh, appropriate uh, to the period, things like windows, doorways, access points uh, for consumers, things like that. All of those things play into what we can do with the building and its potential for bringing 
consumers in off the streets. Um, we're currently running at a capacity that all of our tours are booked by noon on the weekends. So we're constantly turning away walk-up traffic. But it also states that we are a very large draw to the district. Uh, and we only want to see that flourish and grow, both for our business, but also for the district, for the rest of the businesses on the street. We feel that having more attention, having more traffic will only help. We understand that it's important to keep our history and we, like I said, we certainly understand that. We have our own history, very long history with the company. Um, we just think that this puts undue burden upon a business who in good faith went into that district when it was quite blighted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Derek Smith, and I'm an attorney representing Barry Walker's wife, Debbie Walker, in a very contentious divorce action that has been going on since 2015. Ms. Walker has an interest in a majority of the property under construction, under consideration to be rezoned, and at this time, at this time, she opposes the rezoning. You, re you may remember that in June, at an earlier meeting of this commission. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You may remember um, that in June, there was an earlier meeting of this commission when a previous version of the proposal was considered. One of the property owners told you that two appraisers had advised him that the historical overlay would reduce the value of his property from 30 to 50 percent, and they would impact his ability to obtain loans on his property. Similarly, Ms. Walker has been advised by a commercial real estate broker that the rezoning will significantly decrease the value of the Walker property. If that happens, this overlay, then if that happens, this would reduce the value of Ms. Walker's interest in the Walker property. Mr. Walker actually admitted to you at the historical commission meeting that was held at Marathon Village site last year that he is the one who proposed this overlay. I can't speak to Mr. Walker's intentions or his motivations for, initially, for initiating this rezoning, but this action would affect the values of the property to be divided in this divorce action. I alert you that just two weeks ago, the Tennessee Court of Appeals upheld the trial court's finding that the Walker's anti-nuptial agreement or prenuptial agreement was invalid. The trial court found that Mr. Walker had acted in bad faith with respect to that. We know that this commission right, does you, not want- Your timing. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Do, do you have any questions for me? Sure, well, we might have something, but not at the moment, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward. My name is Ken Browning. I own the property at 607 14th Avenue North. It's in excluded from the uh, overlay. Um, however, I do want to offer my opinion that this overlay will stifle development of the area. And uh, as a property air, uh, owner in that area, I think that over time, uh, it will stifle development. Any questions? No, thank you for your time. Mr. Walker. I think a lot of you people probably made a lot of you have met me before. I think the goal for me 30 years ago was to take in, take in a part of town that was really depressed, run down, and preserve the historical value, like we've talked about, the industrial overlay. Uh, pretty much 
Marathon Village was nothing 30 years ago. All we were trying to do on this development overlay is protect the historical value. People, it will enhance more buildings to come in. We have restrictions where they can't run, like put a purple building or some disco ball or some metal warehouse in the district. It's a real important move for us. I think that Nashville, we've lost Germantown from over it for historical structures that are being just wiped out by newer buildings or overpowered by color and re requirements and stuff like that. This is a chance to protect our industrial historical area. It will prosper, it will work. Uh, addressing the black, I mean the brewery, this, the tents over here, I don't think it will hurt theirs a bit. They have loading docks already. There's no more they can grow that could go up. I don't think it's any restrictions for them. Uh, this is a really good thing to have. Basically, we're just wanting to have other buildings to time to match what we're doing. Brick structures, it all looks the same. Uh, I've many examples of what not what to do if you go down to, say, Elton's uh, place where there's just miscellaneous signs, colors, it's just a mess. And one thing, if you researched South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, is the most expensive real estate in the state of South Carolina, and it's had a historical overlay for 30 years. Lower Broadway is $125 to $100 a square foot, the most expensive real estate in Nashville. It has a historical overlay. I think people are speaking of this, don't really have studied this and researched it like I have. Uh, uh, you know, addressing the the issue with the ex-wife, this is all premarital for 10-year property. I don't think it has anything to do with this at all on this case. But I think that Marathon Village can be a wonderful thing. We build structures. All we require is to look basically historical. And height restrictions have been lifted off from 16th back. And we've only got just one or two people complaining or three people saying about it. Most people have understood. We've worked around it. I think we've lifted pretty much most of the restrictions off of Mr. Browning's property, but he, he just don't want to be on it at all. Uh, if you look at what I've done on my properties versus maybe what Mr. Browning's done or other people that are complaining, they're not doing anything historical overlay. They don't care about the historical value of Nashville. They just want in and out for the fast buck, and that's basically how it is. I'm in it for the long term. The reason the brewery is doing so well is because Marathon Village and what I've done, creating an industrial museum and created the, the tourism that we have two to 3,000 people a year is created because what my value did in the historical value of Marathon Village. So they have prospered. Everybody, when I talked Mr. Browning and buying that proper property, he has prospered from my tourism. So I don't think we need to kill the most important thing in the historical value is what's making the Marathon District work. All we're trying to do is stabilize it, make it unique in a, a historical district with character. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Karen Caladimos and I'm at 907 Villa Place. I haven't attended any of the meetings for Marathon Village, however, I have been reading a bunch about it. Um, I, Since I didn't live in that area or close to it, I felt that it wasn't my place. But anyway, um, I, I, I live in Edge Hill and we just passed a neighborhood conservation overlay and much of the arguments that they were just saying were said in argument against our overlay. Our, it's only been about two, three years since our overlay, but we've already increased in value for properties. So I don't think that that's an argument that's for. And also I think that when I travel or when I go to places, I like history. And if everything's being replaced and torn down, then there's no reason to travel there. So I agree with Mr. Walker that the tourism is attracted to the historical preservation rather than away from it. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> we'll close public hearing. Okay. Robin, um, just refresh us. Um, 
this is the recommendation to approve the historic preservation overlay and by the council, uh, Council Freddy. So at this point, where, where would it go? So not to approve it, but to recommend to council to approve it and to adopt the design guidelines. And then he would take it to council, yes. which would have three readings. Yes, and there'll also be a public hearing with the planning department, okay. planning commission. Right, it goes to planning commission next, correct? Yes. Okay, just want to be sure our public knows the process. Okay. Uh, the f question for staff um, specifically mentions in the application that the guidelines are in draft form. Is that correct? But they're okay. always in draft until you approve them. So in, in other words, they're just because it says draft, it doesn't mean that they're expected to change. No. It, it just is, I, unless is, it is, you change unless it we change them here today. Yeah. In other words, there there's not further work to be done. Were we to approve them or disapprove them, they are submitted for approval, not not in Correct. draft form that you might think of otherwise. Thank you. Commissioners, any discussion? Um, I, um, I'm, I'm in agreement with um, recommending it for approval to council uh, with these guidelines. Um, you know, we've, we've had several presentations as a commission for, you know, the data behind, um, you know, what, what this does to property values, but even, you know, that and a lot of the issues that we heard today weren't necessarily even under what we consider. We consider it under the facts of um, that it, you know, is in the, the standards for um, what would be called for for an overlay. So in that regard, I, uh, I'm, I'm in full support of this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Commissioner. I, um, as far as a recommendation, I think it ma hits uh, all of the characteristics that we would look for in this type of um, property. Um, and I understand some of the um, people have spoken their concerns, but um, this, um, and they can obviously bring this up more to council, but I believe as far as our board, this uh, meets all the requirements that we would do to make that kind of recommendation. So I, uh, I agree, I'm in full support. and. Uh, I'd be willing to uh, make an, uh, a motion for approval uh, based off staff recommendation. Um, do I need to do anything different for the guidelines or? You can put it all in one. Okay. Staff recommendation and the adoption of the draft design guidelines. And, and I will second, but with a comment as well. Um, you know, having seen the decades that Mr. Walker has put into this property to bring it up from uh, something like a pile of bricks at one point in time to, to what it is today, it's been amazing seeing that transformation. And it does speak of the authenticity that we associate with Nashville and the historic places. Um, as far as the arguments for degradation of the property values uh, all across the country, that's been audited in, in many, many, many locations and found to not be the case that actually property values do increase uh, when a conservation overlay and landmark designation comes in. So uh, with respect to that, I second your motion and heartily agree with this application. Very good. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 None opposed? <laughs> the motion carries. Thank you. This is 1501 Fatherland Street, deferred from last month, arguing for economic hardship of this home built circa 1930. Uh, since last month's meeting, members of the commission visited the building. Uh, you've also received correspondence about this application. The, uh, as discussed last month, the building has a compromised foundation and support system. Uh, as you uh, go from the rear of the house where you, you enter underneath and um, uh, go forward, the condition of the beams and joists <coughs> gets more and more deteriorated. Uh, the front of the house is built, it's somewhere in here, built, built very close to grade with the front right corner being below grade due to the flow of water runoff down the street. It's visible here. On staff's first visit to the building, we 
uh, had hoped that the structure was in good enough condition to permit rehabilitation and potentially adding on. Um, we reviewed that the grading and foundation obviously needed to be addressed, uh, but it was hoped that the structure could be uh, maybe raised onto a new foundation or certainly uh, shored up underneath. Uh, as they'll tell you today, though, once the owners looked into getting that scope of work done, they told us that they had trouble getting contractors to sign on for the work, uh, as uh, they stated that it was too dangerous. The engineer's report notes the com compromised condition of the structural elements with undersized and poorly constructed framing leading to sagging and damaged structural components over time. The floor and support systems have settled, leaving a difference of more than 10 inches in the floor level. The engineer told staff by email that the foundation work, uh, the foundation needs replacement and that it would necessitate further rebuilding of the framing as that has settled over time with the foundation. Due to the amount of replacement required once the foundation is fixed, staff finds that the building would not at that point maintain its historic integrity. Um, staff therefore recommends approval of the application for demolition, finding that the cost of necessary repairs exceeds the value of the home uh, and that the demolition meets section 3B2 for appropriate demolition. And the applicants here to discuss it with you. Can we just do a little summary as well? Um, because it is a full demolition request that we just, again, be deliberative about it. Um, we had commissioners that were able to go on site and um, give their review of it without having any discussion with each other. Um, and also on the recommendation by the staff, um, there's a gentleman named Pierre Howell that was also on site, and Mr. Howell was hired by Independent. He was his fee was mainly paid for by the Neighborhood Association, and he is a former codes inspector and before that a contractor. Okay. Of course, we see his uh, assessment uh, included in the recommendation as well. Um, and that is separate from the applicant's um, engineer, correct? Okay. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. I need to recuse myself from this. I was not present at the last meeting. I was uh, in town to go to attend the tour, so I think you asked if I would recuse myself from the consideration. Duly, duly noted. Um, The decision to recuse is up to the individual commissioner. So um, if you think you need to recuse yourself, then that's your decision. Okay. You're, you're good. So, but there's a full report, I guess. There's a full report in the packet of the visit and no notes documented. Well, I think that, that they were saying that they not only didn't miss the um, the walkthrough, but the meeting from last month. Yeah. I think that was their concern, was that they missed both. Nor have I listened to the deliberations. I've been doing my full time job. So. Okay. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to stay. You're going to stay with us. No, I think I. You're going to also calls. recuse. Yeah. All right. So we have two commissioners that are recusing, and that's uh, duly noted. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I see a. I also wasn't here for the meeting or the visit, but I've read everything and I've, I've, well. You I've do you feel comfortable yeah. in making a decision? Yes. Okay. Duly noted as well. All right. Okay. Now where are we? Are we? <laughs> we're back and forth on process. So, um, are there any questions to the presentation before we go to the applicant? Okay. All right, Mr. Applicant. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I met a lot of you at the walkthrough. Please, please state your name in. Sorry, my name is Matthew Haggerty. I'm a structural engineer. Uh, I was uh, hired by the uh, applicant to uh, do the initial structural evaluation of the structure. Um, I had met a lot of you at the walkthrough, so it's good to see all of you again. For those um, that weren't there, quick background on me. 
Uh, I have multiple engineering degrees, uh, undergraduate from UC Davis in civil engineering and a master's degree from Berkeley in structural engineering. Uh, I've been a licensed uh, engineer for about 15 years now and um, for seven of those years I was actually a structural and drainage contractor. Uh, we were a design build firm out of California and we would do the inspections, the engineering, and the actual construction work with uh, drainage, foundations, repairs, lifting and leveling of both residential and commercial properties. Uh, in my career, I've seen and inspected probably over, at least over 2,000 structures, uh, half of those being actual projects that uh, our team had worked on and did the actual repairs and construction work on. I would say about half of those, so about 500 structures we lifted and leveled. And I would say in my experience, I've inspected probably over a thousand historic homes. And in my career, I have only recommended, besides this one, uh, I've only recommended to demolish one historic building. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the details of my report. You guys have that. I just wanna tell a quick story of a historic church in San Jose, California that we did a project on. Uh, that church had settled about six inches. Uh, this one had set, is definitely more than that. This one, I believe, uh, from the addition to the front of the house has settled 10 inches. So uh, in the engineering realm, we usually say if something settled more than one inch of vertical settlement in 20 linear feet, it's what we say out of tolerance. Now this church had settled about six inches in about 120 feet, meaning that it, it was about twice normal elevation tolerance. We went in, we put structural beams uh, both on the inside and the outside of the structure, spent a few days setting it all up. And then when we began to lift, um, I usually go in with the crews, measure the floors, check everything. Uh, when you lift a structure, I'd like to tell people it's like trying to straighten out a potato chip. A lot of things pop, crack, you know, especially with uh, further settlement, you know, nails are pulling apart uh, out of framing members. So when you lift and level a structure, there's gonna be a lot of cracking, popping, possible structural damage. Um, and we put a disclaimer in all of our uh, contracts and the contractors that do the lifting here in Nashville have the same verbiage. Essentially, they're gonna lift until more structural damage uh, can happen with further lifting. So uh, in our business, we'll try to lift as much as possible unless further lifting causes any sort of damage. So with this church, the reason I bring it up, it has very similar finishes to this, uh, to this house. Uh, both the inside of these two structures were plaster, which is a very brittle material. Uh, the church on the outside was stucco, uh, which we don't have too much stucco around here. It's very popular in California but uh, this house has asbestos siding. And if anybody knows anything about asbestos, once it cracks, the dust gets in the air and that could be a ha that's a hazardous material. Um, the reason I'm bringing up the finishes is when we lift, attempted to lift this church, um, not only uh, were all the members cracking and popping, but the plaster on the inside of the church got damaged to a point that we had to demolish all the plaster on the inside um, all the uh, stucco on the outside, and these were the areas of where we had lifted and adjacent to it. Um, the church, we didn't have to lift the whole house. Uh, this structure, that would be the case. So, um, and unfortunately, during the lift, um, there was a lot of cracking, popping. It almost sounds like gunfire. It's, it's actually a pretty interesting experience to actually lift a structure. Uh, but we heard a large bang at one point and the foreman stopped the job. The, uh, the preacher at the time came up, started yelling at us. This church has some very large, beautiful stained glass windows, and that was his major concern. He didn't care about the settlement or anything like that. But um, what happened with the large boom is that there was a main structural beam in the ceiling um, holding up a good chunk of the roof, and what had happened is one of the bolts had popped and the beam started to pull away from the column support. So in this case, we were only able to lift the church two of the six inches, meaning that it was still out of tolerance. 
um, and that if we lifted it anymore, there would have been severe structural damage. Now with this house in particular, um, I had noted in my report, and as we had uh, said earlier, the foundation is crumbling, it needs to be replaced. Uh, the root, I had noted also that the roof has settled, settled significantly, meaning that the roofing and the sheathing will have to get pulled off and the roof rafters will have to be reframed as well. Um, so now you're only left essentially with the floor, the walls, and the ceilings. Um, all the main structural girders under the house are rotted or co contractors have come in and put uh, non-code compliant beams and jacks under there, so all that needs to get replaced as well. But when we lift a structure, especially this much with how much bowing there is in the walls, um, to even get within close to tolerance, um, the walls are most likely gonna buckle and have to be pulled off, which means now we don't have walls or a ceiling, leaving only the joist framing of the floors for this structure. So from being a contractor and, uh, and then also an engineer, I'm recommending the demolition, the full demolition of this structure, not only because of the safety reasons, but also it's not cost effective to try to lift and level this structure. Thank you. Thank you. We may have some other questions, but for now, okay. Any other on the applicant team? Are you good for now? All right. Open public hearing. Okay. Um, we do acknowledge that there was um, a letter sent by the Lachlan Spring Neighborhood Association who's opposed to this demolition, just for the record. Um, and there was another as well, but just specifically for that organization. Anyone else? And if not, we will close public hearing. All right, thank you. Commissioners? I, I want to first thank the uh, applicant for deferring for a month so that we could actually come out and see the property, meet with the structural engineer. Um, it was a, it was a fascinating tour and inspection and and uh, discussion that where, where we got to hear what uh, what the applicant had to say about this. In looking at that house, uh, I find that there are some similarities to the church you were mentioning, but there were a lot of dissimilarities as well. Uh, the only plaster we found in the house was uh, in the closet, and uh, the rest had been covered by what looked, appeared to be quarter-inch drywall, and uh, which in a renovation restoration is typically removed anyway because it takes away from the integrity and, and the aesthetics of the house. Um, most of the damage appeared to be in the front left corner of the structure. Uh, the rest of it, as we walked around the house and went under the house and looked through the house, uh, appeared to be uh, in, in a state of being intact. I didn't see the kind of cracking and deterioration, uh, decaying brick, that kind of thing that I see in a lot of these homes. Uh, we have, as a commission, approved full demolition of houses before, and uh, but we don't go into that lightly. Uh, I think with this, I, I do take objection to when, when the, the comment that all the structure was rotted because I saw a good deal that was not rotted. And as an architect, you know, a pen knife is not an exact science, but generally rotted wood, a pen knife will go right into it. And I checked a fair amount of the wood and found it to be solid. So um, with respect to this, I, I hear the report. I understand the applicant's concern. This house uh, is a very contributing house to this neighborhood with um, concerns by the councilman and by the neighborhood association and comments from people like the architect contractor that also sent in that said that he felt this could be uh, preserved. Uh, I tend to uh, concur with that, that <coughs> yes, it's not gonna be as economically beneficial as tearing down and replacing with a larger home, but I think that in the spirit of the overlay and the neighborhood that adopted this overlay, uh, I would oppose the demolition of, of this house. Caitlin, do you have, um, um, since you were there as well? Yeah, and I, I agree with Cyril um, on on all of his points. I guess I just am struggling with the, um, you know, the full demolition. Yeah, again, yes, anything is possible. Um, 
but I guess the requirements for a economic hardship isn't, you know, whether the applicant can afford it, whether the what are the applicant's motives. None, all of that is off the picture. The requirements for an economic hardship are the math of price and estimate for work, you know, purchase price estimate for work versus, you know, the comps in the area once it's, you know, been been referred, you know, what, so it's not highest and best use, it's just will you get any sort of market value out of the home? And, you know, that math, will, you know, has been done for us, so yes, it's kind of guesstimates. Um, but that, I guess, is what I'm, yeah, of course, you know, we do take full demolition very seriously, but, you know, but, if our charge is to see what is, is to do the math for an economic hardship, you know, this, you know, on page six of our staff report, it's, it's in the negative. So that's, that's the one thing that I'm struggling with, I guess, to, to grasp as a, you know, for, for a homeowner to be strapped with that. The chair usually doesn't have to talk, <laughs> but because, um, I also was there for um, that tour. Um, I do concur a lot with um, Commissioner Cyril and also ha struggle with this um, kind of condition. Although, again, looking at the structure of the building itself, I did not, in my eyes, see um, deterioration of some you know, probably wood that will never be built again to any house because it's, you know, very matured wood of years ago, much stronger than what would be built today. Um, which again, that's, you know, consideration for some preservation on that. Um, what I do struggle with is the fact that we do look at the economics. I struggle with that. Um, and I don't know how we ever balance that out because when we see properties in Nashville specifically that um, are renovated and, you know, draw so much more than what the developer or owner put in, um, you know, that's the reality of our economics here in Nashville and that may or may not be, so I do struggle with that. But in terms of um, building that is, um, seems to be structurally reasonably sound in, in its way, other than some of it's probably, you know, we did see um, foundation on one side of the house, I think that was the left side of the house, um, where water, um, drainage could have been, and we say could have been an issue where that's why it's settling there. But I, I was actually surprised at, with the house being vacant for two years with no air conditioning, um, you know, the state of the actual interior of that building. So I have a, I, I'm, it's difficult, but um, you all are going to vote because there's the majority here, um, but I struggle with the with demolition of this particular property. I guess I've reviewed the report and it's good to hear from those who attended the visit. Um, I also agree with Cyril but have the same struggles that um, Commissioner Jones um, relayed. Um, I think the ordinance that describes economic hardship doesn't say that it must be considered. It says it may be considered. Um, so I, I also, you know, the I would think that there's the potential to, to recoup some investment on this with an addition. I think the the costs that are placed in here for market value or renovation of the existing proper, you know, the existing building, not taking into account any additional square footage that could be added. I don't know how the numbers work on that, um, but knowing it's uh, been purchased for development, um, I'm just, uh, just throwing out a few additional thoughts. I, 
I didn't have a chance to go to the actual um, the walkthrough, but just based on the information that we've received and the reports and the comments that we've heard today, I would say that I would agree with the, the demolition. However, again, having that personal experience of actually seeing what it looks like on the inside, I did not have, but just based on the economic hardship and just the overall conditions of the building, I would say that I do agree with the full demolition. Okay. Elizabeth, do you have any comment on this? Am I on? Am I on? Yeah, I'm on. Um, gosh, this is a tough one. And, um, but if a building is structurally sound, that most of it, um, I have a real hard time with voting for a demolition of property, especially when the Neighborhood Association is against it, and um, I, I, I'm just struggling with with that economic hardship. Okay, but as you said, it's it's you may consider it. You don't have to consider it, and um, I just have a hard time tearing down a building that looks like um, most of it is in good order. So that's just my thoughts. Any other comments? If not, we'll, you know, we have, um, again, thank you to the applicant for um, allowing us to give this opportunity. I think that's probably one of our first times that we've actually gone through a demolition request. Um, but you've, you've done a lot of homework and we really appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, I don't know how this is gonna vote, but, um, just know that we do struggle, and we don't do this lightly. Um, and that when other, um, you know, I think what happens as well is that when the neighborhood association who have worked really diligently on creating their design guidelines, and, and specifically this neighborhood, especially the east side neighborhood, tends to have some strong, you know, opinions of how they see their historic, uh, context or historical preservation. So, yeah, it's going to be tough. So we'll see how this pans out for a vote. Um, are you good? All right, please make a comment. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I just want to reiterate real quickly. Um, I disagree about the comment about uh, the plaster, um, the addition was paneling. Most of the interior, the majority of the interior of the original house is plaster. A lot of it, a lot of it was covered up with some thin paneling as well. But when you pull that off, you would find that there's plaster under there as well. Um, and I also disagree that this, in its current state, this property is presenting as a structural engineer. I have to always have health, life, and safety as the major concern of anything I design, anything I repair. And in my opinion, in its current state, this house is a health, life, safety issue. I agree that there's not a lot of dry rot. There is in that one corner, the front corner. Um, the rest of the house, yes, the lumber is in good shape, but from it settling over 10 inches in a little over 40 feet, it is technically in a life health safety issue. So I say my my personal opinion being a structural engineer of 15 years is that in its current state this house is in a structurally compromised state. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's let's do the vote. Madam Chair, yes. If, uh, due to the recusals, it might be best to have the people raise their hand during the vote. That way okay. we can make sure you have the four necessary for a final action. I sure will. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion? Sure. I'll, I'll make a motion. Um, um, based on all the evidence that we've heard, the physical analysis, the expert witnesses, both our expert consultants, both for the uh, applicant as well as uh, for the neighborhood association and who made themselves available to council. I will, uh, with respect to 1501 Fatherland Street, uh, make a motion for denial of the demolition permit. Okay, there is a motion to deny the demolition. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. Any other discussion before we vote? 
Okay. Those in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. That's three votes here. Four. Four votes, okay. And those in opposition of the motion, okay. So we have one. So that means that the motion passes for opposition to the demolition. So again, we thank you for your time. Please know that. This case uh, is uh, an application uh, that was deferred from the December agenda. Uh, so we're hearing it today for the first time, although you may have recognized the staff recommendation. Uh, for this item, the applicant is seeking after the fact approval of an exterior staircase that was constructed without <laughs> a preservation permit or building permit. Uh, the stairs, uh, on that photo there. Uh, as you can see, we're at it on the left side of the house, uh, beginning approximately five feet back from the front edge of the house and leading up to a gable field wall uh, where a doorway was added in what had been an, uh, a window opening. The window had already been replaced. It was not an original window, but it was, uh, the size has been increased uh, from window size to a door size. Uh, currently, the stairs uh, do not meet the standard five foot setback requirements. Uh, stairs with closed uh, risers are required to have a five foot setback. Uh, the, um, the, the stairs as constructed uh, are closer to three foot setback. Uh, the applicant has agreed to remove the risers to have open stairs, which would meet the setback. However, the setback is not the only issue uh, that staff has with this, uh, with the construction. Uh, in, in fact, it's just the stairs itself themselves are not appropriate as a side addition for a house. Uh, additions may be appropriate on uh, sides, uh, certainly on rear of historic houses or on side elevations on houses on lots that are uh, a particular wide house or a narrow house on a wide lot or um, a lot is wider than 60 feet uh, on frontage. Uh, this house meets none of those criteria. Uh, it's a, a fairly typical house on a fairly typical sized lot. Um, the stairs, as you can see, are pressure treated wood with a steel cable railing along the sides and at the top. Uh, these materials may be appropriate for a rear addition or in a more contemporary context, but they are not consistent with the character of a historic house. So the picture there on the right is taken from behind the stair. Uh, the stair actually crosses over a window opening on the first story. Uh, and that uh, obscuring or obstruction of a window opening is also not appropriate. Um, and it also the alteration of the opening size on the upper story gable wall from window to a door uh, is in a prominent visible location and that is not appropriate as well. Uh, there's just a view again from the front. Staff recommends disapproval of the request for after the fact approval to retain the exterior staircase and window alteration on the left side of the house at 1717 Villa Place uh, and finds that the original condition should be restored within 30 days, finding that the work does not meet the following sections of the Edge Hill Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. That's section three for setbacks and rhythm and spacing, section 3D for materials, section 5A additions, and section 6 demolition, uh, partial demolition. Um, as you know, uh, there were two items of uh, emails from neighbors sent to the, uh, to the commission in opposition, and there was an email from the council member sent in opposition. Sean, you said 30 days. 
Is that due to this 60 day that I'm reading? Is that from last month? Oh, or yes. is that, so, what is sorry, the? Sorry, that was, uh, in, the, in December, we were recommending a 30, a, a 60 day. Sure. Uh, but, um, so they requested to have that deferred from the December meeting. It wasn't heard in January because the applicant told us that they had agreed to remove the stairs, so we didn't put it on the January <laughs> agenda. But the day after the January meeting, they sent an email asking to be on the February agenda. So I apologize for not correcting that on the slide. Okay, but it is, in fact, we are going to, uh, the request or the staff, recommends staff recommendation 30 is 30 days. Okay. In, in the recommendation, in the written recommendation, it is 30, 30 days. days. It's okay. only 60 in the presentation, so. That was a copy and paste error, my fault. Uh, and the applicant is here if you have any questions for them. Um, hello, I'm Kristen Dabbs, um, owner of 1717 Villa Place. And first of all, um, my sincere apologies for not getting the permit um, beforehand with the stairs. It was complete negligence on my part. Um, it didn't, it just didn't cross my mind. It didn't seem, there's plenty of houses on our street, as you can see, with side staircases. And when we, my husband and I had the idea because he has a studio upstairs and he often has people come over to the studio to write with them and we just didn't want them always having to use the front door and so we thought it would be great just to have direct access to his studio from this side. So it was done, it was an idea that quickly happened because we found someone that could build it and it just happened really quick and then um, a few weeks after we built it we were approached about the permit and then um, went to get approval from that downtown and then found out it was historic so we needed to get it passed here and so as we've just kind of been on this on this journey of trying to figure out um, what's next and so We'd like to keep the stairs because it's it's nice to have access to my husband's studio so that everyone's not going through the front door. Um, and we proposed that we would remove the front, the fronts of the risers um, to meet with um, code and also um, to, to paint the stairs just to make it more um, cohesive with the house so that it doesn't stand out. But as you can see um, in the pictures, that's just on the one block of, of where our house is, and there's at least 10 to 12 side staircases on that block. And so, I mean, hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of why it just didn't seem like, it just wasn't obvious to me that we needed a permit. So, um, yeah, I think that's all that I have. Okay, all right, thank you. We'll get back with you on that. All right, um, and it could have been that those staircases were probably before their overlay. So, assumption is, I see why that would happen. Um, open public hearing. Okay, close public hearing. Vice Chair, any comment from you? Anyone else? It seems, um, although I understand uh, um, understand what why they didn't think it, it does seem pretty. Uh, um, it, it'd be hard for me to approve it, I guess, based off of just the, there's so many things. I don't know if what all options since it was postponed and pushed back. If there was other ideas that were given to them, but based on what is constructed right now, I uh, I would have to agree with staff recommendation. I agree with Commissioner Tibbs. Yeah, despite visual evidence from the neighbors, I, I think the guidelines are pretty clear in what we do and don't allow in, in terms of stairs and in their enclosure and 
a side addition to a lot of the SWITs and, and all the various guidelines that um, would would regulate construction of this type. So. I, I can understand Ms. Dabbs' uh, assumption that it would be all right based on what was seen. I think part of the reason that the guidelines are established for these neighborhoods and adopted by the neighborhoods themselves is because they want to keep the historic feel of it. Most of the side stairs were brought in during a time when there were absentee landlords and uh, the houses were built, divided up into apartments. And so a lot of those stairs predated the guidelines and but weren't original to the houses. And so I think that, uh, that that's a lot of the intent behind this. I, I would encourage the applicant, uh, if, if they want to maintain the uh, separate access to the upstairs uh, to work with the commission, uh, there may be other ways to achieve it that would be in full keeping with the guidelines uh, and still achieve that goal that they have. But uh, again, I think it's pretty clear and given that the council member and two of the neighbors uh, have voiced their uh, support for removal of this, uh, I'd have to go the same way. Plus the design guidelines as well. So would somebody make a motion, Vice Chair? With respect to 1717 Villa Place, uh, I recommend that uh, we support staff recommendation for disapproval of the request uh, for the retaining the stairwell. Motion. There's a second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Unopposed? Okay. The motion passes. Thank you, applicant. Um, it's clear now, right, that it, you have 30 days to remedy the violation. Okay, thank you. No. Four North 14th Street is a show cause hearing for violations uh, at this property, which was built um, with a different roof form than was approved, windows installed that were not approved, and siding with embossed uh, grain to them, contrary to the requirements of the permit approved. The commission approved the rear addition initially in December 2017. Uh, in November 2018, the applicant applied for additional height for a total of two feet taller than the ridge of the house, uh, which the commission approved. There's the cover page of the initial permit. These are just to give you a general idea of what that, what that rear addition was. So the the addition was approved initially with a clipped roof, as you can see in the side elevations, making less apparent the additional height, the two feet above the ridge. As built, you can see on the right side of the slide, the addition um, was built with a gabled form without that clip. Although this was not built as permitted, the gabled roof is very traditional historically. The additional height above the ridge is minimal. It's 38 feet back from the front of the house. For these reasons, uh, adding up to the fairly minimal visibility of this portion, staff recommends uh, approval of the gabled roof of the rear addition. The Eastwood Design Guidelines, Section 2B1D for materials specify that cement, fiber cement siding when used for lap siding should be smooth and not stamped or embossed. Both the cover page of the permit and the notes on drawings specify this as well. Um, but the addition and the new siding was all done with a uh, the grained uh, pattern that you can see there. Likewise, the windows, notes on the permit and notes added to the drawings require final approval of several materials, uh, including windows. The windows that were installed are a vinyl model, vinyl model that the commission has not approved. Uh, and were also not approved by staff. The windows are single hung. They're shallow windows with grills between the glass and brick molding that is, um, if you can see it on those images, has had the trim um, uh, built around it. In conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the siding and windows and that they be replaced with staff approved materials within 30 days of the commission's decision. Staff recommends approval of a revision to the permit for the roof as constructed with these conditions. The addition will be in compliance with uh, the design guidelines for additions. And the applicant is here to discuss this with you. Okay, we might have questions for you later. Applicant?
Good afternoon, I'm Daniel Reeder, and uh, this is uh, my first time dealing with historical, and uh, so, a little nervous, excuse me. <laughs> um, oh, I've been doing real estate um, since 2008, and working with codes since then. I've never had problems with codes. I got a good reputation with codes. I'm also a Metro employee of 16 years. My, this has been a, a tricky situation with me as I went to do this. Originally, I was gonna tear down the structure. Paul and I met at the property, said no, it's in a, it was in a phone book he looked up, and I said okay, so I spent almost 20 grand doing the structure. We moved forward on everything. Um, I've been going to codes and talking to them, making sure permits were pulled and everything was done right. Paul's been great. A lot of times when I go, Paul's not there, I'm getting Sean, I'm getting someone else, I'm getting no one, I'm leaving phone numbers. It's frustrating, so I go talk to codes upstairs and everybody, you know, I'm getting different things and I've got several emails and stuff where I've tried to talk to people and my question is, it was brought to my attention in July from Fred sending an email to Paul and Paul sent an email to my architect saying that um, after several times trying to contact me, they couldn't, so they were gonna send it to legal, which I immediately responded because Will sent it to me, my architect, said, so what's going on? I didn't know anything about this. And um, I told them they had the wrong name as the owner, parcel owner. Even when I bought it, I showed the HUD, I showed this, and I even sent them the email with my personal number, and codes had it. Ever since the beginning, I got several records, so I never got anything. I talked to the head of codes, and they saw that it was going to the wrong address, so I never did get anything. Um, so I called, uh, I left a message for Fred on his voicemail. He called me back a couple days later. We spoke to it. He figured, uh, I've got conversations when I when I did the roof and it was gonna be two foot higher for the head clearance. I talked to Codes was not there. I believe Sean was there and Paul was not there that day. I went to the head of Codes and spoke to them. Uh, he was not there. I spoke to Tim Rowland who was working in his presence in November and they were both in favor of the, I had pictures of the roof going two foot above and the windows that I was gonna put in that was my project manager at the time had ordered from, or was going to order, they didn't order it yet, it was still in framing, um, from a neighbor that had ordered something similar because all the houses, if you look at the windows, looked just like this and the house did have vinyl windows also. It had wood, it had vinyl, it had, it was a mixture of stuff and I can show you pictures that were not included on the slides where the back of the property had a, I mean, it had plywood, it had siding with embossed, it had regular wood, it had metal, it was just a hodgepodge of everything. And what I'm here today is uh, I appreciate them approving the roof. Um, the windows, to me, I didn't know, and even, see, I'm get, I was getting two different things from, uh, Codes was telling me yes, but I understand now that historical has the final say, and I was wrong, I should have, you know, kept, to my guns and stuck with them. But I, when I talked to him and Fred in July, I said that uh, I had a bunch of personal like my, bunch of personal things with my family going on I didn't know. And I said, I, I have to sell if I gotta rip out windows and I'll do whatever I can with the siding. I made a motion to January to sell the property, got an offer. Um, and I told them about all the stuff that was going on. And the, when the builder went to get a permit to find out about it, they were told that it was illegal, which I didn't understand. So I went to head of legal codes, talked to Quan, sent Quan an update on the email. And then Fred chimed in. And then I just said, I asked, I left two more messages with Quan, never received a call back. I'm just want to know if I can still sell it based on y'all's decision today, because I want to. I'll do whatever y'all tell me to do. I would like to keep the windows since they match the neighborhood. And to my knowledge, it's not a violation to replace windows unless you're doing an addition. Like, I, cause I see people, you know, replace windows all the time in a house. It's like switching out an outlet or a plug, you know, especially since the house already had a vinyl windows on parts of it, not all of it. So it's 1952 home. There was nothing, you know, really historically by the cosmetic looks of the property. So um, I'd like to keep the windows since they're very appealing and they look like the rest of the properties on the street. 
the siding. They did say that it, they'd allow the embossed on the back, but not the front and sides, unless we can do something to that. I'm fine with that and having whoever buys it do whatever. The, I'm just, I'm at y'all's mercy, and if you could leave it, great. If not, I do have a picture of the old siding that's embossed that I can share with y'all if you want to see it on the back of the house. May I pass this? So again, I appreciate uh, the commission. I didn't even know I could be here until I think Melissa here, she told me I could and it's frustrating because <laughs> at times when I come they say they were going to email me and I, I never got an email verifying what I just talked to them about the roofing and siding. So and I, and I told her the other time I saw her and she was very nice and I said with all due respect please please send the email. I mean she's right there. I just wanted to make sure everything was around and these are great people. I don't I know they're busy and they're understaffed. I mean, I work for Metro, I know, so I just want to see whatever y'all can do, and I'll accept it 100%, so. Y'all have questions? Well, my first question is that this is all, a, it's been since 2019, so are you saying that you did not get the notices? No, ma'am, no, none at all. Emails or? Nothing. Okay. Paul was the one that took the initiative when when he got Fred's message, I think, saying that he's going to send it to legal because he can't, after multiple t attempts to get a hold of me. So he sent it to Will, my architect. Architect immediately sent it to me, and I immediately contacted Will, I mean, within 10 minutes. So, Did you have a set of the stamped drawings on site when you were building this project? I did. With the notes that talked about the siding and talked about the windows and well see I was uh, and, and actually it's funny because the my project manager we ordered smooth siding we were we don't like the emboss we like the smooth we ordered smooth siding from Nashville Dis discount lumber on First Avenue as soon as we got it they went out of business we went to sue them <laughs> I mean we're out of that money so the uh, they went ahead and put it up so if I mean I'm sorry I mean I, I didn't order the embossed I don't I mean I didn't Okay, you have any other questions for the applicant? Okay, not at this time. Thank you. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. <laughs> Starting every oh, time. Thank you. I, uh, the, um, well, I actually appreciate staff really reviewing the um, roof. Uh, that was to under, you know, kind of give a leeway there. I, I mean, obviously that would have probably been more um, cost prohibitive, but the fact the the factors that you put in place for it, I thought that was reasonable. Um, my first thought was when it was all three, I was like, looks like it's just a um, blatant not trying to comply at all. So I appreciate you looking at each three differently. Um, I don't see how we can definitely approve embossed. I mean, I've been here for too long, and we've always said can do embossed. So obviously, I just the, the embossed would would uh, we that we'd set a bad precedent by changing that. So I don't for sure that. And and likewise with the windows. I mean, um, those are some of our almost every condition. I think we always put you know well staff always puts on there all you know these are one of the things that have to be approved. So I'm. Um, Actually, in agreement with staff recommendation, um, as far as the selling and all that, I have to probably ask the applicant just to confer with legal afterwards, and they can find out more of that. But based on the application, I agree with staff recommendation. Thank you. I'm empathetic with the um, travails of, of the applicant in, in terms of this, and, and, and others who who have. Um, perhaps um, legitimate reasons why th bad things happen. Um, but I, I think, not I think, I, I know the guidelines are very clear um, with regard to the siding. It's something we've, we've um, caused to have happen on other projects before, even on a project that 
the county that we represent um, yeah. <laughs> installed. So uh, I, I, th I think allowing quarter in one case and not in the other and, and being arbitrary in that regard is just not that's something that um, is I can get behind. And to have um, further just with respect to the, to the windows, to have a brick molding on a window and then frame um, one by trim up to it, it just, uh, you know, brick, brick molding on windows goes on brick houses. Um, it's for a very specific look and, and for a very specific design aesthetic. Um, saving the fact that these are vinyl windows and, and not of, uh, of the kind or quality that are permitted within the guidelines. So on, on, those, t on those two items, I would certainly agree with staff recommendations as well. Okay. Anyone else? Um, so I'll make a motion okay, to, um, uh, uh, to uh, agree with staff recommendation. Is that a motion? <laughs> okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Uh, I, will, I will second, but with a comment, too, that I, I hate it when things like this happen, when the applicant's trying to do the right thing and getting different comments from different parts of, of our organization. But I, I do think that... Um, the, the guidelines are pretty clear, but also having plans that call out specifically these things, um, I think, uh, really does give us not much room to give any leeway in this in this respect, especially given our past history uh, with these with these issues. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. The motion passes. Thank you to the applicant. Seven Beechwood is a circa 1930 frame bungalow that contributes to the historic character of the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Um, so there's a photo of the front, and here are some photos of the side. <coughs> here is the site plan. The addition does meet the base zoning setbacks. It steps in two feet for a depth of four feet at the, both of the back corners, and after that inset, um, the side walls step back out to match the wall of the house. Here are the um, first floor and second floor plans. Um, and you can see that both the first floor and the second floor have that same inset. Um, typically, we do ask for that the second level have um, be set in two feet. So even if that the ground floor steps back out, we almost always want the, the <laughs> second story to be inset two feet. Here are the side elevations, um, which again shows that the addition is a two-story addition behind a one-and-a-half-story house. Staff finds that the two-story scale of the addition is inappropriate to this house, particularly since the second level is an inset two feet for its entire depth. The second level, most of which is not inset, will have an eave height that is nine feet taller than the eave height of the house. <coughs> Staff recommends that the entirety of the second story be inset two feet in order to keep the scale of the addition appropriate. Staff is fine with the first level stepping back out to match the um, line of the house, but again, that second level we want set in two feet. The main form of the addition is a side gable with a 3.512 slope. In this case, the low slope increases the perceived height and scale of the addition and pushes the eave height of the addition taller. The design guidelines state that roof forms should have a minimum slope of 612. The historic house has a side gable with a slope of approximately 612. Staff recommends that the primary roof form of the addition have slopes of at least 612 um, in addition to the, that, um, in addition, we want the, um, that again, that second level to be inset two feet. No changes to the window and door openings on the existing house were indicated on the plans. Um, staff does recommend that an addition of window openings on the ground floor of the right side, since this is a 20 foot expanse without a window or door opening. Uh, finally, here is the rear facade. So in conclusion, uh, staff is recommending approval with these conditions. The addition be inset a minimum of two feet on both sides on the second level. Oh, sorry, I mean, it? Um, the primary roof slope be at least 612. The window, op uh, window openings be added to the right facade, ground floor, where there's a 20-foot expanse of wall space. 
Staff approved the final details of the windows and doors, staff approved the roof shingle color, and staff approved the location of the HVAC units. With these conditions, staff finds that the proposed addition meets section 2B of the design guidelines for the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Melissa, was there a front elevation on this? Um, there isn't. Um, you won't, I don't think one was provided. Uh, I can double check the. Would it have helped <coughs> the perspective? Um, I'm not sure if you would, even on the front elevation, you would be able to see those eaves. You might be able to see the eaves, so um, one wasn't given to us, um, okay. so I don't have one. Okay, yeah. thank you. Melissa, with the staff's recommendation to increase the pitch in the roof, it appears to me that it would um, make the second floor livable space you, much reduced, um, uh, you, you, you're not designing it, so right. you don't know what the outcome of that's gonna right. be, but I, I mean, a possibility could be doing some sort of um, roof system where, you know, there's an eave at that first floor level and then dormers on the second floor. Yes, you probably would realistically lose some interior space, but would be a form that's more appropriate. I, w I would agree. I, I'm, I'm, my question, I'm, I'm leading into the question, which would be, is it possible that a design that meets the conditions would be so significantly different than this that it would need to come back before this body. I, I'm I mean, not saying possible. that it would, yeah, I but mean, I, they I, could, it could be they would submit something that is, um, you know, maybe meets that condition, but it kind of doesn't really meet other conditions or other parts of the design guidelines. Understood. In which case we would bring it back to the commission. Um, you know, this the footprint of this addition isn't, I think it has a depth overall of about 23 feet or so, mm -hmm. um, 24 feet. Um, no, actually, I'm sorry, I think it's the whole depth is about 27 feet. So that's, you know, it, it's modest in comparison could have been to the staff level house. permit sure. almost if it would, if the upper level was set in, so. Understood. Yeah. Um, I, I, that, it, at glance, it, it appears, it appears that that could be a significant design change and, may, you know, could result in a plan change if there's a certain right. square footage that's sought in, in right. terms of this addition. I mean, the applicant can speak to that. I'd yeah, I mean, it curious. could be that they might want to increase the footprint. Um, and I, I think staff's perspective would be, you know, if there was, if it was minor changes, but kind of overall would be something we would recommend approval for, we could just get a staff level permit. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Applicant. Hi, um, I'm Mary Holby um, at 1307 Beechwood Avenue. Um, I live there with my husband, Neil, and two little girls who are three and one. Um, so we have been in the home since 2017 um, and moved into the 12 South neighborhood with a vision to um, really plant roots and be there long term and invest in the community. Um, and so we were really excited to move to this 12 South neighborhood. Um, we have um, a three bedroom, three bath, as you can see. One of the beds is uh, nine by 11, so it's really more of a nursery office um, area. Um, and so we are maxed capacity right now, and we are looking to grow our family. Um, so the purpose of our renovation is just to have more room to spread out um, and grow our family, so more bedrooms as well. Um, and so we considered moving, but again, like I said, we just so love where we live. Um, we love our neighbors. We are 50 yards from our church. So um, we felt like renovating was the right move for us. Um, we, our, our goal in this renovation is to maintain a backyard. Um, it's so rare to have a backyard or any yard at all in this neighborhood. So um, keeping a backyard is, is really important to us. Um, so a little bit about the renovation. We would like to add two bed and bath upstairs and a larger family dining room downstairs. Um, so we approached the staff and we were really grateful to Melissa who um, was so great about communicating your guidelines, um, which we would like to abide by. Um, 
so the first set of feedback was the inset. And so um, this is our neighbor's house. This is 1309, not 1307. Um, so you can see there's, it's kind of a far picture, but there's an inset there um, where it goes in two feet and then comes back out. So when we got the um, guidelines and the recommendation to do an inset for our, at the beginning of our addition, um, based on our neighbor's house, which was approved within the last five years, um, we based it off of that. So then we came back um, and got additional feedback from the staff um, with a two foot inset for the upper story all the way back. Um, and this was really hard to hear because like you mentioned, this would completely alter the floor plan upstairs. and. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we really want to have this as a long-term home. Um, since we feel so invested in the community, um, we want our kids to you know, have sizable rooms upstairs as teenagers, not just as a baby in a nursery in a nine by 11. So um, we're really hoping to have two more bed and bath upstairs um, to add to the back of the house. So we're really hoping that this isn't a deal breaker. Um, and so again, the roof, um, you know, we uh, heard that the feedback was that you could only go up four feet and that um, unless it's not absolutely necessary and she didn't think it was absolutely necessary. So we complied and um, took the roof line back down so it's the same height. Um, and then adding windows, which we're um, happy to add windows to that wall that she's talking about. Um, so those are um, the three pieces that I wanted to touch on, and um, we're hoping that you'll reconsider the upstairs two foot inset all the way back instead of just for a portion of the house. Thank you. Thank you. Open public. Oh. And I think our contractor is okay. going to say a couple of All things. Right. Thank you. Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Nathan Douglas. Uh, and as Mary said, I represent the contractor here. Um, this is, as she's mentioned, the second set of plans that we put in front of the staff, uh, working with Melissa through some recommendations. Uh, we changed the original roof line. Um, we brought it down below the current ridge of the existing house uh, and actually changed the way that it ran. Originally, we had it running front to back. Uh, and made the change left to right, as you see on the plans. According to her recommendation, um, one thing that we mentioned is that we haven't maxed out the, the footprint that we have. Um, try to keep this as small as possible, as Mary mentioned, by not taking up the entire yard. Um, you know, that they maintain the backyard. If you go to this neighborhood, most people have made the addition as large as possible. Uh, that's not the case here that we're trying to do. Uh, we're also not act asking for an accessory dwelling, uh, which is approved in this neighborhood as well, which would take up more of that yard. Um, and we're keeping everything under the current ridge, um, the roof line, uh, as requested by Melissa and the staff. So those are some things that we just wanted to point out uh, and that the idea is to have the design complement the rest of the street in the neighborhood. Uh, and if there's precedent with the neighboring house and there's Countless other houses uh, within a two or three block radius uh, that look exactly like our design um, and our intentions uh, of staying within those guidelines. So, thanks. Thank you. All right, open public hearing. Good afternoon, my name is Michael Ward with Allard Ward Architects and I'm just here for another case, but I have a really specific question about this one in particular, and I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So if an addition sets in two feet on both stories, it can be a two-story addition behind a one-and-a-half-story house. That's the question. I haven't been able to submit any of those for the last two and a half years, so that's, that's my question. I just want to make sure that's what everyone's talking about, and we can agree on that. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> if not, we will close public hearing. <coughs> And commissioners. Thanks. Help us through that. <laughs> I don't know if we can answer that question, Mr. Ward, but not maybe not today, <laughs> but <laughs> um
I was actually thinking the same, I mean, I had the same question um, when I first was reading through this one. Um, so I was trying to look back at, at some previous ones and, and I couldn't find it. So maybe, I mean, staff could, could enlighten a little bit on that, um, just because I, that was honestly gonna be my first question as well. Okay. I mean, here it would likely be most appropriate to have some sort of dormer form, particularly if we're asking for the pitch to come down. Um, that would be the most appropriate would be to have, like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm trying to think of cross gable or, or you know, front facing gable, <coughs> rear facing gable with dormers coming off would be the most appropriate and what we most see and how we usually direct people. That's why it would have been great to have a front elevation. <laughs> At least for me, it would have, but anyway. So you could kind of see where all that comes through. But. The applicant has put forth this example next door, um, which doesn't answer the two-story addition on, on the one-and-a-half-story house, but I think having, and I think the applicant said previously they had presented uh, a, a design that had the rear facing gable and, and the front would have intersected the existing roof similar to in some way to the roof plan indicates um, sort of the connector between the one and a half story and the two story it seems that that could be figured out architecturally and, and from a construction perspective uh, when you present a side gable with a side gable that's two to one and a half those roof shapes definitely contrast greatly in, in, in my view, and, and all the guidelines typically say that. So I, if nothing else, I, I think uh, uh, turning the orientation of the roof would, would prevent this even taller um, wall of, of uh, siding on, on the side of the house. That still doesn't answer the question of, of uh, having the roof shape come down and a, a two-story addition on a one-half-story house. You know, when I look at this, it's a beautiful house. It's a, you know, great contributing home, architecturally significant, and uh, and it, it does come across like a two-story structure behind a one-story house, without any doubt. I, I appreciate the applicant's desire to have a good uh, backyard. It's almost 74 feet from the back of the new deck to the property line. That's, that's a pretty good-sized backyard. I would think that, uh, you know, when you, if you inset plus you, uh, make the roof steeper uh, like the recommendation is, I think it calls for a different design that would appropriate, that would more appropriately fit with this house and with this situation, so. And I, I applaud wanting to keep some backyard and, and keeping this addition modest. I, I think argument's a little bit specious in that this is a significant deck that runs all the way across the back of the house that, you know, is wide open and, and Having deck covered, uncovered is, is, is obviously the applicant's choice, but I think there, I would agree, there's certainly some room here to be able to um, not greatly increase square footage and cost and, and, and be able to have what they need and, and be more in compliance with, um, with the guidelines. Okay, well we are making a decision. So, any? I mean, I, I'll just say uh, with the, uh, I mean, I guess I'm hope, you know, I'm generally against the, the two-story form behind the one and a half story. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess with, um, I don't know, you know, depending on how we vote, but I mean, I, like Commissioner Mosley said, I think the change in what we're gonna at least, you know, the least change of what staff has recommended will, will involve a whole redesign, I mean, it's not, so, um, you know, that's, that's, I guess, what I'm thinking, but then overall, um, I guess, at, at the beginning, I didn't understand the, the entire premise of it being the two-story behind a one-and-a-half-story house, um, for me, personally, my thought process. Do we pose the question as if we've done this before? I mean... Again, when somebody asks us this, and of course another architect has brought us a, a question whether we <clears throat> present difficulty for ourselves in the next application. I think that's kind of where I'm a little bit hesitant on what, yeah, 
can you bring us through that? Sure, I mean, I think our, our, our thoughts were basically it's, it's inappropriate to have a two-story behind a one-story, and by kind of bringing that second level in, it's the way it's going to be designed in, our, in my mind, and maybe I didn't make it as clear <laughs> in the recommendation, but that it would be more of a one-and-a-half-story form versus a two-story form. But maybe it didn't clearly say that, but if you go to a 6 and 12 pitch and we consider the applicant statement that they've already come with something that was taller, they're really, it's not stated, but it's implicit in, in the recommendations that you, you can't Right, that's multi two, 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 two yeah, story I mean, would be appropriate, it, right. The, the only conclusion one could draw from that is that it can't go up, so the, the you know, the, regardless of the turn start, of right. the gable, there's going to be less space in the half or one story, however it right. turns out. There will be less space in, in, in a few, you know, whatever the application, if we approve the staff's recommendation, it will look very different from this. I mean, you could, I have to. If, if the commissioners wanted to, one suggestion would be is you could make it clear in the recommendation that it needs to be a one and a half story form, perhaps with dormers um, on that second level that are inset the commissioner wants to go that way. Would, would that, could, could a project like that be improved at the staff level? I, I, I forget exactly. Um, what I got, we, all, we look at the footprint as well. So I think with the footprint of this size, it could. If the footprint got significantly bigger, um, you know, if it came to us new with a larger footprint, we would bring it to you. Um, I don't know if you wanted to maybe if, say at what point you want to see it back. Um, I mean, I, I definitely could foresee that if if I were the applicant and I was losing some space upstairs, I might want to increase the footprint. Um, so I don't know if you want to say, if, as long as it's not increasing it by a certain amount, it, it doesn't have to come back. And I, 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 yeah, I, I tend to trust the, the staff's judgment in, in these in all areas. I, I just want to make sure we, we there's a the clear understanding and in deference to the applicant, if if we don't delay their project further, we can figure out a way to not delay their project further and, and have something that's more in keeping with the, with the guidelines. Uh, I, I don't know that, I wasn't suggesting that it needed to come back okay. as much as I was suggesting that it won't look like this. Sure. I mean, generally, one of our general rules of thumb is that we don't want to more than double the footprint of the house. So um, I think anything that would be more than doubling the footprint of the existing house, we would, staff would not be comfortable with approving that. We would bring it back to you. Um, Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that, commissioners? Does it sound reasonable? Okay, so can someone please make a motion? With with conditions? I, I would move that with respect to 1307 Beechwood Avenue that we deny the application as submitted and, uh, and um, reference the conditions that were stated by the staff as a starting point. Uh, Retaining the height limitation that is there, and that uh, that we deny this application based on those those comments. Okay, and th is there a second to this motion? There's a second. Um, any discussion? Further discussion? Or is that clear enough, comment? Robin, for the staff? Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? None opposed, and the motion passes. And thank you, applicant. Continue to work with staff, please. Thank you. For a, excuse me, for a rear addition and attached garage to this contributing building in the Belmont Hillsboro Conservation Overlay. The project requires a setback determination of which staff recommends approval. The proposed addition is one and a half stories with a basement level due to the grade. The additional footprint is 1,194 square feet compared to the existing 1,503 square feet. The ridge height is six inches lower than the ridge of the house. The foundation and uh, height and eave height match those of the house. The outbuilding meets the design guidelines for height and scale, design, location, roof form, proportion and rhythm of openings, the materials include fiber cement siding, brick and stone, aluminum clad win wood windows, and have been approved on similar projects by the commission. 
uh, with the condition that staff approve the usual materials, masonry, roofing color, windows, doors, garage doors, the application meets section uh, 2B1D for materials. The width of the addition matches the width of the historic home at approximately seven feet from the side property line. Uh, a setback determination is requested for the side of the new construction facing Portland Avenue. The commission has routinely approved rear additions matching the width of the historic building, uh, but getting into setbacks, uh, section 1712030 of the zoning code requires 20 feet of street setback. Section 1720060D, parking area design standards, requires that garage doors opening onto a public street be a minimum of 20 <coughs> feet from the property line. Uh, the section on street setbacks also allows for the setback to be reduced 50% when the rear setback of a corner lot is oriented toward the rear setback of a neighboring lot, as is the case here, hence the usual 10 feet from the side property line. Uh, it's, of course, the Commission's decision to determine appropriate setbacks, uh, but that's how staff arrived at the 10 feet that we are recommending uh, for this project. Um, staff has suggested that the just the garage doors could be recessed, as we've seen on a project or two in the past. Um, overall, this addition, attached garage, setbacks, it's very similar to a project approved by the Commission in 2016 at 2100. 20th Avenue South, one block away. That one's at the corner of 20th and Bernard. Uh, in that case, the addition also matched the existing width of the house and was approximately six feet off the side property line. Um, I don't know if our staff was reviewing side setbacks the same at that time, um, but as we try to direct applicants uh, in line with the requirements of other metro departments like zoning and public works, this is the reason for our recommendation in this case. Uh, so, summing up, staff recommends approval of the setback determination with the condition that the addition's left side, or at least the garage doors, are moved to 10 feet off the side property line. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the setback determination. Staff recommends approval of the addition and attached garage with the conditions that the left side of the addition, or at minimum, the portion housing the garage doors, be moved at least 10 feet from the left side property line. Uh, that staff uh, approve materials, brick and stone, roofing, windows, doors, garage doors, and uh, if the utilities are moved, that they are located uh, to meet uh, minimal visibility in accordance with the design guidelines. With these conditions, the proposed addition will meet um, the section of the guidelines uh, for additions. And the uh, uh, any questions to Paul? Okay, Paul, thank you. Paul, well, I've got a question real quickly before you step back, just for clarity in the recommendations uh, that are uh, proposed. If we're 10 feet for the area of the garage, would that be 10 feet for the, the facade that includes just the doors themselves at the basement level or like, you know, 10 feet from there kind of running all the way up? In other words, could you put the addition out on some columns and and or I, I just wanted to get a little clarity as to what that what, where the 10 feet starts and stops and to what it applies in the elevation. I think we left some flexibility in our recommendation for that um, that that it could just be the portion it could be the garage doors themselves to accommodate the the applicants design. Um, I think that's why we put that in there, sure. is, is to allow for that. I would, and I asked for, for maybe similar reasons, is the facade of the house has, it sets, establishes a line, and, and if you get, we see it, but is it good, is sort of these funky ins and outs that might result in a less appealing um, scenario in, in, you know, in, in the final eva in evaluation of it. I think the 10 feet and, and 20 feet and 10 feet are established for, for reasons of, of safety and in, in backing a car in and out of that, that pulling a car in and out of that thing. I, I just want to make sure I understood the staff's perspective on um, reaching the recommendation and, and reaching the conclusions. Thanks. It, it also may be worth noting, you can see in the, the over, overhead imagery here that there is a, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a, a median, but there's the property line and then there's uh, a curb, uh, I think about eight or nine feet uh, away from there. Just so you get the context. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Applicant. Good 
afternoon. My name is Michael Ward with Allard Ward Architects. I'm here representing uh, the project at 2020th Avenue South. We were also involved with the project at the corner of 20th and Bernard, and we've been involved in other projects on corner lots, so this is something we're quite accustomed to. This particular owner had been looking for a house for quite some time and was only interested in a house where he could have a garage in the basement. He wanted to preserve the yard, and this is a beautiful backyard. Um, so we found this particular house. He got it under contract. We urged him to have the lot surveyed immediately so that we could verify not only that the grades would work, but that also we could verify with Metro Historical that this would indeed work. So with a lot of work and a survey bought, we uh, met with staff on the 12th of December last year to review this project. And this is the site plan that we reviewed with the specific question of where can we place the wall and where can we place our garage. And all that is clearly stated right here on this particular drawing. Knowing that it is a sensitive topic, it was the first question we essentially had to ask before we proceed with our design. We weren't asking for an answer on that day. We were willing to wait as long as it took to talk to whoever is necessary to be involved in that decision. On December 17th, the email I received, afternoon guys, we took a look at the 20th Avenue project earlier. The lot meets the criteria for an attached garage and the width matching the side of the house is appropriate. We may need to request a side back determination officially for the Portland side, but we don't see any major issues. Carry on and we'll give you a full review when you're ready next month. I proceeded with this project and the layout of this house Hence the reason for the question was what will our garage doors have to be set back from the street? If we need to pull them in a little bit, we can, but it totally alters the plan of the house to pull the garage doors in three feet. It basically pushes the garage under the house three more feet. The fact that we can leave the walls at least in the same location is extremely helpful, but the owner works from home and he has a basement office that sits behind that garage and it will be seven feet wide. So I need some clarification on exactly what we're required to do. And we can recess our doors, but and I won't read the other emails that came afterwards, but we were basically <coughs> left hanging with a very specific question that I asked in plenty of adequate time to give everyone a chance to find out from zoning what in the world we were supposed to do. And we have obviously mentioned our project from beforehand, but never considering that precedent, wanted to make sure that we were on the right track with this one before engaging the amount of time and effort it requires to negotiate this. This is another one of those one and a half story additions behind one and a half story houses. These are very difficult to mass. They're very difficult to put together. And the other one earlier, I mean, these just aren't allowed, you know, two story box makes this thing a lot easier. But the way all these roof lines are woven together and these insets have to be put together for egress windows and roof lines are very complicated. So you know, shoving walls in and out a couple of feet uh, when a project is already you know, being reviewed by contractors is, uh, is a big ask. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Okay. Discussion. Maybe um, just uh, in light of the applicant's uh, original, can um, staff just comment to that? Maybe was there a different um, approach then or something? Just, just maybe we can get a little feedback from that. Sorry, I don't want to go there. Do you mean about the, the previous project? Oh, no, no, not the previous project, about uh, uh, the applicant <laughs> stating he had spoken and was given the go-ahead. Is that what you mean? We Our reviewed the, the site plan. Our staff looked at it in December, as Mr. Ward uh, mentioned. Um, I think it was not until we reviewed the complete application that staff agreed that zoning and public works would require more setback. So that was our recommendation at that time. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, sh sh sure. Maybe... Um, um, Do you want to pass that around? I guess we could look at it. It's important to see it because it, it couldn't be. I thought it was fairly clear. 
I'm also, I'm curious what the distance is from the, I guess the face of the garage to the street. As drawn, I think it's 15 feet from that side of the addition the and the house. Uh, it's 15 foot five and a half inches. 15 foot five and a half right inches. Base and the size of most, even larger vehicles, is in that range. Suburban 16.6. They don't get much bigger than that to get down the road. You do have the issue of the sidewalk crossing, but I think, you know, somebody that lives in an urban neighborhood comes wheeling out of the garage. I mean, it just, it, those, those are things that go along with living in a neighborhood, <coughs> being a pedestrian, and paying attention. Yeah. Go with yeah, I was I was also thinking about that. Um, you know, with with the the ten foot, you know, from the property line, and then seeing where the property line is, and it's not, you know, the street line. To me, is um, I guess what I was saying. You know, that there there is a lot of space to the street, um, just because of that that shifted curb cut there. That's that's pointed out in the um, in the drawing. So. Now, thinking about that, to me, I don't know. I think the property line is just kind of an arbitrary line. I mean, it is a line that exists, but um, as far as the safety standpoint, it's not the street. You know, I could see then that that would be, okay, well, then that's too close to the street. But in this instance, um, you know, it's quite a bit of space there. Um, so that's, I guess, my thinking on, you know, being able to retain the current, the current line, the current design is designed. Well, we can't ignore, to that end, well, we can't ignore safety and yeah. what we deliberate, it's certainly not our job, I, I, I would argue. Um, we, we certainly don't want to make things unsafe, but if traffic and parking or, or other metro agencies have some, take some issue with the setback determination and can um, have some standing to cause the applicant to do something different, then so be it. Here, I, I think while it wouldn't, um, our, we're, we're more concerned with aesthetics and, and where things sit on the lot and, and are they appropriate. And I think the establishment of a setback from where the location of the existing house is, its relationship to a property line that allows even some more space that, that takes into account that safety. To me, the, the issue then just becomes purely an architectural one and whether this is in keeping with the guidelines to move that out or, or to move it forward or back. And, and I think taking that additional precaution, not necessarily a bad idea, but I, I don't know that it's necessary in terms of what, what we review. Yeah, I, I guess just on, on that point, I agree with Ben as, as far as the, the uh, architectural. I don't know, um, and, and it does seem like the, you know, to your point, Caitlin, about the, the street, there's definitely, seems like it wouldn't be as potentially a safety, but you're right, that's not our jurisdiction to say that or not. Um, and, and especially as an architect, I understand this is at least the implication that they thought, you know, it felt like it was, they could go forward with it and they didn't want to go forward till they knew it. Um, but I know Michael has been here a lot, so it's not like it's somebody who just first time around. So I, mm -hmm. I mean, we can't help but to put take that into consideration. So I know that he's always worked with you guys pretty diligently to make sure it complies. So I don't think it was blatantly at all to to do that. Um, so first, I'm just I agree with you, Ben. I don't think this, from, definitely from architecturally, from a historic standpoint, and especially from the, all the other um, effort to put into it, that this works well to comply with our regular um, our requirements. It's just really a, based off of that. That if it, we're in a, if we feel like the six foot, just based off of this property line is is appropriate or not, and. 
I guess I'd say, how could we, if, if we were going to go forward with it, I'm not sure how we would um, uh, work with the change, you know what I mean? Like if we say we allow six this time, you know, would we say that it was, um, how would we kind of word it to make it where we could not set a precedent? Because I, I, I agree, I don't necessarily see as much of an issue with this, especially with, uh, you know, the way the sidewalk is, but I don't. I don't want someone else to say, you approved six before. I, know, I would, yeah, to that, um, to that point, uh, this, what makes this case individual and unique, and in all the cases we look at, there, there's some constraints here that, you know, the width of the lot, it's not overly wide, and if you were to take the same design and just sort of mash it back the additional four feet, you run into setback issues on the other side, the massing of it gets wider and deeper into the lot, um, which many times we'd like to take into account the own, you know, an applicant's desire to do keep some open space or yard or, or, or any of those things. At the end, we've got the you know site constraints and the architectural constraints that we deal with. I think for those reasons, this is unique and, and specific to this site, and, and wouldn't necessarily open the door to somebody else to say, oh, "I want to, you know, you gave six. Uh, I, I think it's specific to this. And I, if you. Architecturally, I mean, I'm compelled that architecturally, if the line of the house is consistent as opposed to set back, it, while it wouldn't be necessarily, given the applicant, it would look fine at the end of the day, but would it be, is it, be, is it worse? Or, or, you know, for what reason do you, you know, does this thing sit back? And I, I wonder, so even if you accept that and you push the whole house back, that's one thing. If you just put the garage doors back, how much safety, if it's for safety, if that's the reason, because we determine the setback, and, and typically it's precedent that's set by other buildings or for some compelling historic reason. In this case, the house is already, I mean, it's there. And we've seen this not have a, a bad effect at other locations where it's done, where we've determined this setback. So for those reasons, I think the additional, you know, just mash in the back, I'm not sure how much safety that, that you would gain from that other than making it harder to construct. And with the um, 15 feet, I'm sorry, and with the 15 feet, we actually have a car length, if I'm under, kind of right understanding. Yep. Yeah, so. Certainly enough to be able to, you know, yeah. The hood's still in the garage. You, you, can, the you can see still, that, yeah. you know. You don't want the car sticking out. Sure. But yeah, uh, and then to that, I mean, if this were just an addition, you know, say, and you wanted the setback determination that was going to go beyond the house, wider than the house, or even in the back, if they were looking for a setback determination in the back just because they wanted it, you know, bigger, but this matches the existing house at the one we're talking about, so that's, in my view, why I'm okay with it. Okay. I'm willing to take a stab at it, but stab at it, but I want to make sure that the uh, mo the motion is done right, so it doesn't um, <coughs> set up a precedent for like for better. Well, I think our, our yeah. deliberations are always part of the public record. That's true. So. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But yeah. You're right. Yep. Okay, but um, anyway, I'll, I'll I uh, make let me make sure I've got the as I've always said. Excuse me. Can I uh, throw one more thing out? I'm sorry. Can I just throw one more thing? Oh out? yeah, please do. <laughs> Architecturally, sure. you all have been talking about no. As uh, much as you want to, um, Madam Chairman. You know, again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, you know, I, 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 that deliberation is like, okay, is it because of the safety or again architecturally? So that, I, I get that. Um, you know, that is a busy street. I'm going to go there. Um, so, is it a safety issue? I just want to be sure we're not throwing something out there that. We're not really, we're saying, oh, well, we shouldn't have done that because of it. I feel like to that end, oh, well, I, you're, you're, you're not necessarily worried about safety. I don't want to say what you are and aren't worried about, but I, I think in terms of our ability safety to do that, it's the general. applicant's choice to make this presentation and for us to evaluate it on its merits. The applicant would be liable for screeching out of his driveway and running over kid or backing into traffic or whatever else. So I, in terms of safety in that regard, um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not compelled. Now in terms of public safety, which we have some obligation to that, 
maybe colored in a slightly different conversation. Well, and because possibly because it's a corner lot um, is more, I, that's why I bring that out, because it is a corner lot. Now, if it was a, an interior lot, that, that wouldn't be a question, but um, anyhow, just to be sure we've talked about it all. On corner lots, though, you're allowed a reduction, and then I know really we have to respect the property line, not the edge of the street, but in this situation, there is, you know, a fairly generous distance from the property line to the edge of the street. You could pick this up and move it somewhere else and you could have a property line that's much closer to the street. Um, so the fact that there's well, what, about 17 feet from the edge of the street to the face of um, the garage, I feel like is a, a huge factor in this consideration. Okay. 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 All right. Reasonable. <laughs> okay. I make a motion that uh, we approve uh, 2020th Avenue um, with all staff recommendations except for um, condition number one um, that we approve it as set back on submitted drawings uh, based on deliberations and conversation at this. Uh, meeting as well as uh, uh, emphasizing though the this particular lot size and the uh, existing building existing home already second. there's a motion there's a second all in favor aye. 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 aye any opposed none the motion passes thank you commissioners um, do we um can we take a five minute break yes Oh, we have one more. No, it's... Oh. We have the consolidation. Yes, yeah, so. consolidation. It takes break time. before the consolidation. Oh, break. this we is gone. Okay, yeah. Are you ready to... Con all right, well, we'll just... Break. Oh, so then they can go. Yeah. All right. You agree to a break? <laughs> okay. No. Okay. They can leave. All right. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. <laughs> but... I think I'm going to go. Okay, just as a little background and reminder. Um, this one got moved. Oh, never mind. The last, the, yes. she was thinking that Sorry, the last item. Sorry, I thought we had one item, more. Oh, that, that's been deferred. Got it. It got deferred. That, so I thought we had one more case. Deferred. That's why I said, why don't we just oh. finish it and then. Would you like to take a break? Then? I, yes. I would like yes. to take okay. a break. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Historical Commission for a design guideline consolidation project. The project began in January 2019 and the grant period ended on September 30th, 2019. A draft came to the Commission on September 18th of 2019 and was deferred until March of this year. The current draft is available online at the Nashville.gov Nashville website as well as all other information uh, regarding the project. Change it. Thanks. The project was first presented to the commission in three parts. Part one is a consolidation of all the neighborhood conservation design guidelines into one universal set of design guidelines, with part two being individual chapters for each district. All the neighborhood conservation design guidelines are already very similar, but the consolidation will provide an opportunity to reorganize and add clarifying language. The third component is to create new design guidelines in a plan book for outbuildings but that has since been removed from the project. Next, please. There are, these are the design guidelines and, and not hard and fast rules, so I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, so the language here does not preclude you from continuing to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis based on the physical conditions of the site. You will continue to take public comment at and up until the March public hearing, but I would encourage people to send us their comments as early as they can so we can include them in any revisions proposed in March. Again, the most current draft is available on the website and has been there since mid-January. We recommend that you now take public comment on any portion of the design guidelines, and then I have some information to guide your discussion about outbuildings, which was on your schedule for today. Okay. Should we take 
public comment first. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for waiting. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Dan Gotchberg. I live on Villa Place. That's in the Edge Hill neighborhood. Uh, I have two comments <clears throat> about the overlay. Uh, one is a procedural issue, one is a substantive issue. On the procedural issue, uh, there are a series of emails uh, that are given out to stakeholders, people who are labeled stakeholders, uh, that say how the procedure is going to work, when meetings happen, what will be discussed at the meeting and such. Uh, I've made multiple written requests to be included on these emails, and those have been refused. Uh, luckily, my neighbors forward me the email, so I get the information, uh, but as a general procedure, it'd be great if any homeowner could get all the full information not have to be part of a special group, which I'm not sure how to become part of. Okay, Can we, you want us to address that right now, or go, that, is that? That'd be fine. I, I think we've got uh, public. Is that is that still open for comment? Then I, I would recommend finishing public. Yeah, finishing. Comment. Yeah. Go. Is that is? Uh, okay. That's the only procedural oh, okay. question. There's one substantive uh, issue. Uh, Let's see. Right now it says, as I understand it, uh, quote, there should be a minimum of 20 feet between primary buildings and outbuildings. In the approved language for the Edge Hill overlay, it says generally there should be at least 20 feet with exceptions uh, for lots backing onto commercial properties, quote, due to the lack of a traditional rear yard. I would suggest that uh, that softer type of language uh, recognizing exceptions when there's a lack of uh, traditional rear yard be included, or at least as for Edge Hill, so that doesn't change for the Edge Hill portion of the overlay. Okay. All right. Anything further? No. Okay. That, that's the only substance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Um, any other public hearing here? No. Nope. You're good just to listen in, okay? <laughs> All right. So to express, uh, to address those two issues, there is a stakeholders list and those uh, people were appointed by their respective council members. And so we didn't want to change that list in the middle of the process. Um, there's also another list of anyone who's expressed any interest and information has gone to them. But the stakeholders roles to get that information to their neighborhoods. Um, and in terms of the 20 feet being, you know, being some flexibility, as explained a few minutes ago, you have that flexibility with every single case. These are guidelines and not rules. So to get to the topic of today, which is outbuildings, uh, most of the design guidelines have two to three sentences for outbuildings that are not already italicized. So that's all you really have for guidelines. So that was a big impetus for this project was to get actual guidelines for outbuildings. Uh, the direction given is that outbuildings should be compatible with historic outbuildings in terms of height, scale, roof shape, materials, texture, and details. It's not really possible to have a usable outbuilding in this age that is similar in scale to historic outbuildings that were typically a true one-story building with one bay. In next image, please. These images are from a study conducted in 2008 of historic outbuildings. Today, outbuildings are used for more than just to store cars and uh, garage uh, garden tools. They serve multiple functions depending on the underlying zoning. Several years ago, the italicized information was added to follow the ordinance requirements for dad use as many applicants requested that the regulations be the same. In the most recent draft, posted again last month, uh, we recommended removal of all the references to the form book, part three, because you decided um, in September to remove that portion. Next slide, please. Generally, the maximum dimensions in the draft are similar to what they are now in the italicized language for outbuildings, except that the dimensions are not tied to the existing house, with the exception of corner lots. This means that there could be cases where an interior lot has a garage that is taller than the historic building. Due to an outbuilding's location towards the rear of the lot, staff feels that the additional height will be negligible in most cases. Uh, the height of an appropriate outbuilding on a corner lot will still be required to not exceed the height of the primary building because of its high visibility. So this, is, this picture is just one example. This is obviously not a historic outbuilding. It's not a new outbuilding that was approved by you, but it is a two-story outbuilding. And it was hard to get it all in one picture, but that's at the back of the lot. And then you kind of see the second house in there. That's the, the house that's behind. So when you're standing on the street, even though it's a two-story outbuilding behind a one-story house, you don't really see it. 
Now, of course, there are going to be instances where the grade rises and you certainly would be able to see it. So I just wanted to check with you on that and see what you thought. So, Robin, then does this, does the new wording give us the ability then to be more flexible than we have in the past? Because you know, one of the things we had in the past that was real restrictive was the eave height of the outbuildings, and, and it sounds like you're talking more about the overall height versus the eave height. Eave it? height and ridge height, it's very, very similar to what it has been, but instead of trying to tie it to the historic building, which could restrict the eave height more and restrict the ridge height more, the current language is that here are the maximums. In today's case, although it wasn't an outbuilding, it was an addition, would probably be a pretty good something to respond to, you know, if you took that as an outbuilding and put it on the back of the site with that house on the front, still just a lot, I mean, it's just a lot of surface of siding that is, I, I think we would certainly still review that as, is this appropriate or not for the form of an outbuilding? I agree, yeah. but, but we have had some in the past where- Abs Absolutely, it's kind of like, we're talking about like six or 12 inches and it, it appeared reasonable uh, to begin with, but because of the guidelines, there was certainly some, some room that, or we had to seriously consider whether it was in, fit, in keeping or not. It's a good comment, and I agree. And I, as long as it, again, you know, I don't want to put, so there's two sides, I guess, I don't want to put too much on staff of like, oh, we trust the staff, and then they're deciding, you know, more stuff than they're comfortable with because there's so many, you know, requests, but then on the, on the other hand, you know, I, I, I do trust the staff, and if this gives us the ability to, you know, but still look at the, the ones that, you know, might might not be, might be a little questionable, you know, the ones that aren't administratively permitted that come to us, um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, like we've always done. Um, you know, there are instances where, you know, I could see it could be appropriate, but just, I think, giving blanket, you know, approval to any two-story form know, gives me a little bit of pause, you know, depending on the, the size house and where it sits, you know, in the, in the and, I, and I like the part about the corner lot, obviously, because it's highly visible, but um, still having a little bit of oversight of, of each individual lot, I think, is crucial. I think the photograph may have been confusing. I was just using it to show the massing of a tall building. But the draft says, on outbuildings behind primary buildings that are one or one and a half stories, wall heights of an outbuilding shall not exceed 12 feet. And for an outbuilding behind a primary building that's two or more stories, wall heights of an outbuilding shall not exceed 17 feet. So you're still getting that one, one and a half outbuilding behind a one and one and a half story house. Um, but it could, because that max is at 25, potentially, again, this mm -hmm. is just a draft, that could mean that something taller than the house is in the backyard. Okay. And with Reference to a specific case, not that the guidelines are drawn around that, but there was one um, that was uh, it was a two story. It was a one story with a two story behind, but it was a very modest one story house that was not seeking an addition. This would be applicable, I guess. This guideline would certainly be applicable to that instance. And and again, where you know these are guidelines, not rules. So right. So that would be something where we as staff, following the guidelines, would advise someone that they cannot have a two-story outbuilding behind their house. But as always, they can come to you and ask for whatever they want. And again, you may say, oh, well, the footprint's only 500 square feet. So in this case, it, it is appropriate, or the, you know whatever your reasons are. I think the hardest part about outbuildings is that when we were talking about additions especially, it's that historic home that's guiding you on what's appropriate. Right. And when you're looking at infill, it's the historic context that's guiding you on what's appropriate. With an outbuilding, we've been much stricter about it because there isn't that piece that says why this project is different from another project. So that's been the, the tough part about outbuildings. Um, the draft includes clarification on, on how even ridge heights will be measured, which we just talked about, and we're using a drawing that was created for us for the form book, so that form book isn't completely lost, um, but to further illustrate how those measurements will be taken, because there's been confusion about that in the past. Um, we also, re in the draft, are requiring that roof slopes be at least 412, so that means that, um, if you go back to the previous one, um, so that means that um, flat-roofed buildings would not be appropriate. 
comfortable there, with that. Have there been a lot? I can't remember. There have been a lot. I'm thinking about like what, Germantown or like the the ones with like kind of. And Germantown has their own <laughs> guidelines and a whole different animal. Okay. Oh right, because that's historic. Oh yeah, right, right, right. right. Um, okay, I can't remember any that were requested no. at all, but okay. And then the draft also simplifies how measurements of dormers are done. Before we were measuring the linear um, measurement from eave line to eave line and the dormer from wall to wall. And so this is proposing that it just be the same. If you're measuring it from wall to wall, then measure both of them from wall to wall. Um, setbacks are defined more closely uh, following the bulk standard requirements for safety reasons, especially for corner lots. Um, also clarified that any projections beyond the footprint would be considered in determining the appropriate setback. So that was something we had talked about last month or a month before. Um, if we're only looking at the footprint, what if there's this bay sticking out or what if the eave is overhanging? And we wanted to, I know that historically outbuildings were much closer to property lines than five feet historically, but they're also nowadays much bigger than they used to be. So we put that five feet in the draft. Robin, so if in that case that we were just talking about, would these new, uh, the new, or not new, but uh, consolidation, would it be different? The like this particular one, you know, one we, what we just heard, would it change um, setback? I'm talking about the setback. Well, that's an that. addition, and these are setbacks for the outbuildings. So the setback for additions oh, and it. infill is still based on, again, the historic context or the historic building. But again, since outbuildings don't have that context to follow, we put in a set setback. Okay. Okay. I just, a minimum ding -ding. setback. Just, yeah. Right. We've not, I mean, in the past, we've had setbacks that there's not a, a rule that I think, you know, oh, it, it needs to be three. I mean, there, there have been cases where we've had one or zero and up to 10, depending, depending on the individual cases. Is that, would you say that's an accurate statement? <laughs> Our concern, though, is that um, going less than five feet, again, is more problematic than it I'm, used yeah, to I'm be. Not, I'm not arguing against that. I just was sort of stating how we've done it to this yeah. point. There's, there's not, you, I don't think you could pick 30 no. cases and say, oh, it's seven or three or whatever it is. And I'll say the other concern, too, is a lot of these outbuildings have dwelling units in them. And there may be an outbuilding on the neighboring lot that has a dwelling unit. And according to fire code, they should be at least six feet apart. If that other outbuilding is already close to the property line, that can cause a problem. So I will move on. You can change now. Thanks. And um, for the most recent draft, we also reused the add-on features from the old form book. So to refresh your memory, um, an add-on might be hood and awnings, and then there's some guidelines on you know how deep they can be and how wide they can be. Um, there's one for stairwell bay. That's just for uh, projects that are less than 500 square feet to allow them room to get that stair in. Wouldn't be <coughs> allowed for larger ones. Um, next slide. Uh, an enclosed vestibule, a projecting balcony. That shouldn't exceed more than 30, uh, 30 square feet, one per building. And next slide, please. Projecting oriel, a projecting porch. Next slide roof dormer and wall dormer. So again, all those things have different specifications on how big they can be and whether you could have more than one on the building. So we looked at it and thought, well, okay, if somebody maxed out all of these and put all of them on one building, we felt like it would still be appropriate. Any thoughts there? If you, uh, that was a question I was curious about. If, if you were 500 and you did the projecting stair bay, and then you popped a dormer on both sides. Some of the others are, I guess you could put a vestibule on the other side of the stair bay. Mm -hmm. um, well, you're getting bigger than, considerably bigger than 500 feet in that regard. I, I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing, I, I, but that was a, quite the next place my mind jumped to was that all these things cobbled together, right. you know, it didn't, didn't, it actually doesn't seem excessive. They were seemed reasonable. Yeah. When, and we, we looked at that, obviously. Yeah. And if you look at these, they don't really add square footage. You know, a vestibule, an open porch, um, a projecting bay, oriel. Um, 
So it's unlikely someone will collect all of those in order to get a much bigger building, because they don't really, they provide maybe a little more light and a little more feeling of space inside, but they're not really increasing the square footage. And I will say that there were, I think, five different designers that are frequent applicants who were kind enough to really help us with, this is how it's working in the real world. And so they kind of helped us determine what's this appropriate eave height, what's this appropriate ridge height, what, how can we make these work and still fit in a stair. So I greatly appreciate the, the guidance they gave us on that. You mean based on like joist steps and mm -hmm. floor to floor and, right. Yeah. So let's say having, having tried to squeeze a stair into a small footprint, I, I would say that, that's, that's a, some quarter that would be welcome when you're trying to design yeah. an outbuilding. So we will um, make what we expect to be minor changes based on what we heard today and based on any feedback we receive. The final draft will be presented to you in, at your regularly scheduled public hearing on March 18th. And at that time, we'll be back at our usual location on 2nd Avenue South. Any other comments before we? And is, that, is that where we adopt the? Yes. And, and, uh, and I may have missed it when I was out, but for the neighborhoods that have requested to opt out of this, where's what's our position on that at this point? And we'll, we'll address that in March. Yeah, we'll have a full recommendation for you for, for everything. Still working. Um, what, so the, I'm trying to look at that online on um, the consolidation already online. Mm -hmm. Is that, where is that under? <laughs> if you go to Nashville.gov. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then you go to departments, Yep. Metro Historic Zoning. On the left-hand side, there's a link directly to the consolidation project. Okay. And that's not been updated. I know you mentioned that in the past, that you, but this is something that we can review before March yes. and make the comments. Say? Absolutely. Yes. Um, to, to make comments on anything that we might find. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Good. And anyone else. Right. Yeah, and anyone. public as well. Yeah. Okay, I think that's where we probably need to the, focus on. Yeah. I'm sure, I was doing it. But so, but the, we'll, the final draft, we won't have the opportunity to review the. F oh, yes, of course, just as you always do. Okay. So the draft that's available right now is the one created to, in January. Okay, so it's as close to. I, I believe it will be. I mean, I have no way of knowing what kind of public What's comment gonna, we may receive in the next few weeks. But my guess is we're talking about some minor tweaks, you know, a typo here and there we caught or, you know, some other t minor tweaks. But I cannot say because I do not know what the public comment might be. And we'll just follow the, the submission guideline. You know, you have to take an application in. I know the public hearing is still open, so that may not be the case. But so the staff doesn't have to turn this around in 24 hours for the, for the close of comments. You're... You're several. Well, that's why couple, we encourage. Couple weeks out. Are you a couple weeks out, and and that will be our sort of final read through, or, or will it be right up to the right up to the day of? It'll be up to the day that we write the staff recommendation, but the public hearing remains open. People can come to the meeting, and might convince you to make yet another change. Sure. Nothing's set in stone until you decide whether or not you're approving it, or not. I guess how soon after we adopt it does it go into effect? And that'll be part of our recommendation, which again, you can take or not. I guess my thing is, is if, I mean, by looking, waiting till March that we actually have, you know, enough of what we can look at and go, yeah, this is going to be the final draft. I guess that's my whatever question, yeah. you know. The issue is the public hearing's open, and it will be open yeah. the day that you review it. So you may make changes that same day. In there's, March. Right. So there, you know, until the public hearing is closed, there's really not a way to have you, give you a final, final draft. And so if we're not happy with the final draft in March, mm -hmm. we can defer it? It, you can deny it. You can approve it with conditions when we and close changes. The fair, yeah. So we would close public hearing in March. Wait, maybe, maybe not. I mean, that'll be up to you. If you're deferring it, you we probably have, want to keep it We have so much open. leeway here. 
record. If you're deferring it, you probably would keep the public hearing open. Yeah. For the record, there's been lots of ample time to. Yeah, there has been lots of ample time for sure. Right. Uh, agreed. Not yep. to say we have to decide, but there's been a lot of time. Yep. I think it was not just that. I mean, it's no. just reviewing draft is really, you know, my OCD-ness is going, I'd like to see, you know, this is really what we're going to see from here on out until it gets changed again. That's kind of my... But if we're going, going to it. address public comment, which I'm sure you all want to do, there's no real way to do that. Duly noted. <laughs> okay. All right, any other questions for? I mean, and also, I mean, yeah. you know, what's online now, you know, that we've been talking about and reviewing for months, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, she's saying the bulk of it, as they're, you know, going to propose to us and recommend is the same. So, I mean, if you read it, you make your own notes, see, you know, maybe, oh, I have a question about this, or I have, a, I have an issue with this maybe, potentially, and then I'm sure they're gonna know what has come up in this coming three, four weeks with public comment, and you can just make a note, you know, in the March meeting, or, hey, you know, what, from this, what are the, what are the major changes? I'm sure they're gonna go through it of what we had for the last meeting, you know, what is public comment made change in the last couple weeks? So just to point out the specific things, but not necessarily that you can't review the whole of it and, and have been reviewing, you know, now. So, but you know, they'll know what's happening with the public comment and what they're hearing. So you could just and you, you will know, too ask. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah be so and yeah, we you. get it. Yeah, also, but um, so anything that they get. Um, but I mean, you know, any changes that are made due to that in their recommendation of the draft, you know, just I'm sure they'll just point out, like, hey, this, this is what we've been talking about, but it turns out we're going to do this or, or whatnot. So that's what I would. Okay. All right. It's good to go through that. So the public also hears that as well, because you know it's been a long process, and yeah. so and you're, we're we're so into reviewing everything, and then it's like, what's the summary? Yeah. And and I think it's a pretty good summary. Okay, everybody good with that? We, we can adjourn? Yes. Okay, well, I'm going to do this thing and say we're adjourned. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.